bardzo.
Good evening, everybody. Welcome to tonight's development control meeting. There are no fire alarms, alarms scheduled for this evening. Therefore, if the fire alarm sounds, please evacuate the building immediately. The fire exit is located at the rear of the room. Please go down the stairs and meet in War Memorial Park. Please note this meeting is being webcast live on the internet. And could you please turn your mobile phones off or to silent? For the benefit of members of the public watching or participating in this meeting, I would like to explain who everyone is. My name is Councillor Nick Robinson and I'm Chairman of this committee. To my right are councillors who will be making decisions on the applications on this evening's agenda. To my immediate right and left are officers who will be presenting the applications and providing advice to the committee. The Development Control Committee is a regulatory committee, not a political meeting. The committee will be considering the published papers, examining the, examining the evidence brought before us tonight and will make decisions based on planning reasons. We are guided by national and, plan and local planning policy and guidance. At the appropriate time, I will invite speakers to contribute to the meeting in the order set out in the update paper. May I ask all speakers, including visiting members, to speak clearly and keep points made on the application on material reasons only. No further dialogue between the members of the committee and speakers will be permitted once questioning has finished. All speakers will be reminded of their permitted, permitted speaking time and will be advised when they have one minute remaining. My school committee members to avoid repetition and keep any comments on each planning item to a maximum of four minutes. This evening there are eight items on the agenda and I hope to do it with all within three hours. I understand that planning can be emotive and ask that everyone remains polite and professional throughout this meeting. Thank you. Item one on the agenda, apologies for absence and substitutions. I have got Councillor Tuck standing in for Councillor Frost. And looking around, I don't see any others. Declarations of interest. Ooh, where do we start? We'll start with Councillor Howard Sorrell. Uh, item five, I'm wanting to speak on it as a... As a councillor and then I'll step up the room. You'll be speaking as a ward member? Yeah. Uh, as a, uh, sorry, as a visiting councillor? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> councillor Rattigan. Um, just as a note, I wanted to note that I've spoken to one of tonight's speakers, uh, Tony Forward, on three occasions in the last week about this application, twice before I knew he was speaking and appearing tonight and once yesterday. I have not given them a view on this application and advised them to refrain from contacting me until this evening's meeting is finished. That is just so as if I vote the way he objects, then there is no question that I have not taken this seriously and have come in with an open mind. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Rattigan. Councillor Gaskell. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, item four um, in Newnham. Um, I'm parish councillor for Newnham. I live in Newnham. I have discussed this in the parish council, this, this application. I see myself as pre-informed, but not predetermined. Thank you for the clarity. And obviously, item, oh, Councillor Tuck. Thank you, Chair. Yes, um, also for item four, um, I attended as the borough councillor to Neenham Parish, where the owners gave a small presentation and then visited the site after. But likewise, I, I feel informed. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Tuck. And also, what's your what's one? Thank you for stepping in at sh such short notice. Two hours is um, pretty short notice. Um, item number eight. Um, obviously, I will be leaving the room for that item, and it will be chaired by Councillor Harvey. Thank you. Um, urgent matters. I have nothing. No. Nope. Minutes of the meeting held on the 9th of November. I'll propose them from the chair. Could I have a seconder, please? Councillor Rattigan. Thank you. I'll sign those at the end of the meeting. 
Right. Applications for planning. Number one, which is land west of Etchingswell Road, Bishop's Green, Newbury. A letter. Thank you, Chairman. Um, good evening, members. Good evening, Chairman. Um, I would like to start with an update to this application. A um, couple of things. Um, first, public observations. Um, after the report, officer's report was published, um, six letters of support have been received. Um, in summary, um, comments that were made um, are that the development is a logical extension to an existing um, development. Um, the site would, be sustain would have sustainable access um, to the existing settlement of Bishop's Green. Um, References are made to um, the site having access to wider services and employment opportunities um, in Greenham, Newbury and Basingstoke. Um, also, reference has been made to um, the site being well contained in terms of visual impact and inability to expand further. Um, also, references have been made to the neighbourhood plan and the um, emerging allocations in the neighbourhood plan and the overall support for the um, various sites which were taken forward through the publication um, exercise so far, stating that um, a portion of this site that we will be looking at in a minute has um, received um, the most support from the local um, residents. Um, there's other um, aspects mentioned as well, um, but you will be familiar with this already. Um, two more objection letters were also received, um, and they refer to the site um, not being suitable to accommodate this um, scale of development, um, referring to the existing traffic and speeding problems, um, also referring to the rural character of the site and this proposed development having impact on its scale, character and layout, um, reference to bus service being in inadequate, um, also reference to um, no amenities or facilities in place. And um, I leave it here um, because I don't want to take too much time You've got the paper in front of you. Um, next update is to do with the um, Secretary of State call-in. Um, so um, you will um, recall the, the report mentioned that this application was potentially called in by the Secretary of State. This came as a request from a third party. Um, the Secretary of State reviewed um, the proposal and the officer's report and determined that actually the local planning authority is best placed to make a decision on this application. And from this follows the revised recommendation, which no longer includes the paragraph saying that decision can't be made without um, hearing from Secretary of State about the um, calling in. So this is the end of the update. Um, I would like to um, present the application um, just to expand a little bit um, on the proposal um, and perhaps explain um, various aspects of this proposal um, just um, to be um, of assistance. Um, so the application is an outline application um, for up to 42 dwellings um, with associated open space, vehicular access of Etchingswell Road, and it's, the site is located in Bishop's Green. Um, so all matters are reserved with the exception of access. Um, and the application was registered on the 24th of January, 2022. So it's been with us um, quite a while now, um, but really works just to give a little bit of um, context with works have started on the application um, when I became the case officer, um, when I started working for Basingstoke and the Borough Council in April this year. Um, so this is the location plan um, and it shows the site. I'll make it a little bit bigger because I was hoping it would be bigger on the presentation, but it's not. Um, so as you can see, the site is outlined um, in red and it sits um, on the western side of Etchingswell Road. Um, just to the north 
of the um, existing settlement or village of Bishop's Green, and so it just sits to the north of the edge. Um, to the north of the application site itself, um, actually, let me have a, I see, I've, I've lost the pointer. Um, so to the north of the application site, there is a little bit more scattered um, residential development um, of um, single dwellings. I'll just make it a little bit bigger again, um, because I want to, um, give you an idea of how large the site is. Um, so if you can see the vertical line, um, so the south to north, that is about 170 meters. Um, then going horizontally across um, at the wider um, point, um, that's 190 meters. And towards the south where the site narrows a little, that's about 180 meters. Um, we've got, I will, I will come back to this, but for now I just wanted to draw your attention to the woodland, ancient woodland, which is a thing. Um, it's here, the, 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 it stretches by 80 meters. Um, if I actually make it a bit smaller, I, you will see. So this is about 80 meters um, in length and how far it goes into the side. So here, um, I'll go back at this more northern <coughs> aspect, it's about eight meters. And then um, on the southern aspect, it's about 15 meters going into the side. And then there is Yanga woodland um, on the other boundary, um, on the eastern boundary. And again, the width varies. And closer to the northern edge, it's about 12, 13 meters. And then in the south, it goes up to 22, 23 meters. So there is a little um, variety um, in the width of the woodland. Um, this is an aerial photograph um, looking now um, southwards, um, looking towards the existing um, village of Bishop's Green. Um, so you will see here um, the boundary screening. So this is the young woodland um, adjacent to the main road. Woodland and hedge um, screening, um, which is just between the application site and the existing Bishop Screen village. Here you can see the extent of the ancient woodland. And here is the northern boundary of the application site, which is a public rights of way. And this is perhaps the most visible point where this application site is the most visible from. A um, couple of more photographs. So this is an existing access. Um, so um, there is already a vehicular access onto the side. Um, and you will see next to it, there is another vehicular access. And behind this tree, which is a um, tree preserved um, order tree, behind this tree is um, a public, the public footpath. Um, a photograph showing Etchingswell Road, I'm sure you're familiar with it, um, and the bus stop and the proposed access would be just um, to the south um, of this existing bus stop. You can see here the existing um, public footpath. Another photograph, this one is actually taken from um, the southern um, side of the um, of, of of, of the site is actually from um, Bishop's Green Village um, itself showing um, boundary screening um, into the um, application site. Um, another photograph just to give you a context um, of the actual application site. So um, it's basically it's um, grazing paddocks fenced off and um, these are existing stables which are proposed to be removed and here behind you can appreciate the ancient woodland. Um, I included the slide um, just to, in terms of planning constraints, um, to, 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 to explain um, what, what constraints are to the site and where they are. Um, so I'll just start from, from the top of this first um, slide. These, 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 these come from the actual um, planning submission. So um, this is a triple SI, um, so part of the um, Greenham and Crookham Commons um, triple SI. So it's just to the north of the application site. And here, here you can see the um, river and Bourne with its um, associated floodplain. Um, the site 
itself obviously is to the south and um, you can see the contours here um, so you can see the topography of the site sloping down um, towards the north of the site if you can see this yellow star here this is just outside of the application site and it, it indicates the um, tree um, which is um, covered by a TPO and here there is the ancient woodland which partly enters into the application site um, greenery, hedges, trees um, on the southern um, boundary and other trees, young woodland um, on the eastern boundary. Um, moving on to the next slide, um, I included the slide because I wanted to indicate um, the existing um, equipped play area in Bishop's Green Village and I will come back to this, um, but this is where the applicant would be expected to provide financial contribution um, to enhance this play area um, to serve the existing development. And this slide shows the actual Greenham and um, Cookham Commons triple SI. Um, the reason why I included this slide is I just wanted to show you that the yellow here is the application site. And um, again, the applicant would be expected to pay financial contribution um, to offset any additional um, mitigation, sorry, additional pressure, recreational pressure onto the, um, onto the site. And the reason why I included this map is because it shows the existing paths. So these are existing paths for visitors. Um, the Wildlife Trust generally encourages visitors into the site. However, Currently, majority of the visitors come from the north, from Newbury area. And this is to the north where you have the car parks and you have managed areas which are shown in green. Um, so all the visitor infrastructure already exists to the north to, um, to accommodate the visitors coming from the north. But currently, other than the actual paths for visitors, um, the southern element of the triple SI hasn't got that infrastructure or the resources in place. And this is why the, the, the applicant would be expected to provide financial contribution to provide the resources needed to offset that potential additional impact. So finally, um, this is the proposed indicative layout. Um, as I mentioned, the application is in outline form. And this means that today what we are assessing is the access only, the vehicular access onto the site, and the principle of residential development um, in, this, um, in this location. Um, so I'll just explain a little bit um, about this development. So the, as I mentioned, the, the exi I forgot to say, the existing, um, which I have shown the photographs of the ve existing vehicular access. So the proposal would actually close that vehicular access and um, that that site would be planted with, with vegetation and this is why there is vegetation shown on this indicative layout and a new vehicular access would be provided to the south of the existing bus stop. Um, and so the road would, the access road would take um, into the site and then there would be um, a lower hierarchy road um, that would lead onto the dwellings and um, into private drives. Um, you can see that the dwellings are located further away from the application site boundary and from the um, existing um, wood, ancient woodland um, the sink, um, as well as from the vegetation on the southern boundary and the vegetation from the um, on the young woodland on the um, eastern boundary. Um, you can see this plan is indicative only, but it shows you how up to 42 dwellings could be um, distributed across the site. Um, so you can see from, from this slide here that the density would be actually lower than the density of the um, northern element of um, existing Bishop's Green Village. Um, so the, the, the density would be um, a gradient density which would mean there would be higher density within the center of the site and then there would be a lower density on the edges and this is to create that more of a rural edge character and round off the existing um, 
village. Um, you can see here um, there will be, a, I will come back to this, but there will be a Suds Basin um, part of drainage strategy. There will be a green, um, a village green within the centre of the site, again with a swale part of the drainage strategy. Um, to the south is the um, proposed um, footpath connection um, onto Haria Road, and there will also be another um, connection. The details would be um, determined at the reserved matters stage, but this is only indicative, but that means we can approve or refuse um, this application with, 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 with links onto the public um, rights of way. Um, I'll just go on to um, another slide. So this is the existing access. Um, sorry. I apologise for that. I was just advised um, to clarify that the recommendation is for approval. Um, so this is the proposed access. Um, this plan shows the visibility space. Um, and um, the proposed access with the associated um, footpath connections um, on both sides of the access um, and the visibility displays. There are also trees um, shown um, on, um, on this plan. Um, however, where the access is and given the geometry of the road, actually the visibility displays are within the verges um, of the um, of the highway, um, so there wouldn't be a need to um, remove any trees um, in, in in order to um, achieve the necessary visibility space. So this plan, um, I just wanted to um, highlight um, the tree removal. Um, it needed um, to um, accommodate this development and also the, um, the landscape strategy. Um, so there will be removal of a couple of trees um, which are within the ancient woodland. Um, however, these are category um, U trees, um, which are generally, um, in most cases, are trees which need to be removed for good woodland management. They often are dead trees um, anyway. Um, then there is a um, couple of other trees, again, um, U category trees, um, just south of the um, existing access, proposed access, um, hedge removal in, a, in accordance, in, in order to create the access. Um, and there would be also a loss of one category C tree. Um, so this tree has got more, more value than category U trees, um, however, um, it's, it's in terms of visual um, quality, there wouldn't be um, any harm in, in losing that tree. Um, and also this slide shows the additional proposed um, planting. So there will be proposed planting um, on the northern boundary of the site. Um, the additional planting where it, the, the current vehicular access exists um, and further, further planting um, on, um, on the eastern um, boundary of the site. So um, I'll just show one more slide. Um, these are the green buffers, um, and this is the 21 meter um, green buffer to the ancient woodland, um, buffers to the um, vegetation which grows on the southern boundary, and buffers um, to the vegetation um, on the eastern boundary. So I'll just um, go to the recommendation. So the application is recommended for approval, um, subject to conditions listed in the officer's report, and the legal agreement um, to secure 40% of affordable housing um, provision, including first homes provision, um, provision of on-site 
open space, provision of off-site pedestrian connections, contribution towards enhancement of off-site play facilities, which I mentioned at the beginning of my presentation, contribution towards bus infra infrastructure improvement works, um, contribution towards recre recreational mitigation, landscape management, biodiversity management, including biodiversity net gain and travel plan. Thank you. Thank you, Arletta. If we could have our first speaker, please, which is Mr. Homer on part on behalf of Ettings Wells Parish Council. The speaker's seats are just to your right. Uh, so, thank you. Good evening, Mr. Homer. You have four minutes. I will warn you when you have one minute remaining, and the microphone button is on the deck in front of you, and it lights up red when it's live. That's it. This Thank one. you. That's the Thank one. <clears throat> uh, I am Neil Homer, Chairman of Town Planner of 36 years experience. I've supported almost 200 neighbourhood plan projects over the last few years, including Etchens Well and Berkeley uh, in your borough. I've been asked to represent the Parish Council this evening. The Parish Council objects to the application. It is an unsustainable development proposal. It is in the wrong location for a proposal of this size, and it prejudices the making of its neighbourhood plan. <clears throat> In presenting the 2021 settlement study for the emerging local plan, officers stated that supporting the council's climate change strategy is the golden thread running throughout the plan and locating development in sustainable locations must be central to any strategy. This is the essence of the plan-led system. Bishop's Green is only a small village at the lowest tier in the borough hierarchy with only 227 houses and no current settlement boundary. 42 dwellings represents a 20% increase. This is not a small increase. The neighbourhood plan has taken seriously its responsibility for maintaining the currency of the plan-led system in the absence of an up-to-date local plan. Ironically, had the neighbourhood plan itself proposed this scale of growth, I would have expected your officers and the neighbourhood plan examiner to conclude that it would not be in conformity with strategic policy and it would have failed. Paragraph 50 of the... the <coughs> National Planning Policy Framework states a refusal of planning permission on grounds of prematurity will seldom be justified. Seldom, however, does not mean never. And I consider your officer's failure to draw to your attention the case law established in the adjoining parish of Berkeley less than two years ago renders their report misleading. In his appeal decision on the Hearts Lane scheme, the inspector considered matters of prematurity to the neighbourhood plan to be a main issue of the appeal. In dismissing the appeal, he concluded, and I quote, the proposal is so substantial that it would undermine and prejudice the outcome of the plan making process. Given the importance assigned to neighborhood planning as a locally owned process, these are adverse impacts to which I give very significant weight. It is my view that there would be an unacceptably high probability that the plan would be derailed at the referendum stage with an unacceptable denting of future parish confidence in the benefits of neighborhood planning. That is the inspector's quote. There have been no significant objections to the proposals of this neighbourhood plan, and your officers and other statutory bodies all consider it meets the basic conditions. We do not expect any new objections to be raised in the period that ends next week, and we do not expect the plan to fail at referendum, in which case you do not have to wait to use the prematurity as a valid reason for refusal. This is not complicated. If there would be no chance of your committee approving the scheme without the tilted balance in play, then you have valid reasons for refusal. Had your council considered this the right place to build this number of homes, then surely that's what it would advise the parish council to plan for. But it did not, and for sound planning reasons. You have one minute remaining. Thank you. Officers should have acknowledged the true harm to the plan, but this has been significantly understated. If you decide to approve this proposal, you will leave the parish council with no choice but to consider withdrawing the plan, as it will have no confidence in winning the referendum. This would seriously undermine neighbourhood planning in your borough, as you have a very level, high level of neighbourhood planning activity. Neighbourhood plans live and die by how they're implemented. A planning authority's encouragement at the plan making stage, stage means nothing if it won't back that up in decision making. Your committee has a vote now that should not lead to the community itself being stripped of its vote in a few weeks time. You have valid reasons to refuse the application and with an adopted neighbourhood plan, the case law and the parish council alongside you you will win any appeal. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Homer. Questions for the speaker? Councillor Howard Sorrell. 
Thank you, Chair. Um, in the update paper, we have some letters in support, and one of the comments is that this site is the least unpopular out of all of the things that were considered to go into the neighbourhood plan. Um, based on what you've just said, how, how can you respond to that? If it is the least unpopular, then it's not necessarily us taking uh, planning uh, authority out of the hands of local residents in terms of the neighbourhood plan. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm going to leave it to a colleague to answer that question specifically. Um, more generally, you need to know that the neighbourhood plan went through a site assessment process, taking into account not just community opinion, but also all of the technical reasons, and it came to that decision based on the blending of those reasons. I'm led to believe that what was said in that, what was read earlier, is not true, it's not accurate, but a colleague will explain why for you. Thank you. Councillor Rattigan. Thank you very much. Um, I've been lucky enough to have a copy of the draft site assessment. Um, and I look at it um, um, on ACOM's recommendation and their interim report. Nine sites were, were tabled. Um, the site in question has no uh, negative effects. Uh, in fact, it's much better than the site that's being proposed by the parish council. Um, that seems in direct conflict with what you said. Can you turn your microphone off, please? Oh, <clears throat> the uh, ACOM assessment was based on the much smaller scheme of this site, which is a third of the size of this site, not the site that you've got in front of you now, the proposal, rather, that you have in front of you now. It was based on a scheme of, of 15, which the Parish Council tried to encourage the land interests to promote through the neighbour plan process, but they chose not to do so. Thank you. I'd like to pick up on uh, Councillor Howard Sorrell's report. Um, on the consultation with the, the uh, community, I note that this site scored 100% more than the site selected by the Parish Council. That does seem rather a bizarre way of dealing with your, your residents. Councillor Rattigan, we are in its questions to the... Speaker, could you, could you ask the Speaker a question, please? Why, I'd like to know why you've ignored the community assessment uh, when this site scored so poorly. Thank you, Councillor. <clears throat> My colleague will answer that question for you in a moment. Any more questions? No? Thank you very much. If we could have Mr. Forward and Ms. Dane, please. Good evening. You have four minutes between you. How you divide that is entirely up to you. I will warn you when you have one minute remaining. It, it will light. It's one of the buttons on the on the deck, and it lights up red. That's the one. Thank you. Good evening. My name's Marion Dane. I'm here as a parish resident, although I am also chair of the parish council, and I will be speaking for both residents. You're being asked to approve this application largely on the basis of a presumption in favour of sustainable development, in the absence of an update uh, and up-to-date development plan. According to the, sorry, according to the, uh, somebody is setting something off behind me, saying. Paul, could you stop the clock for a sec? Um, if somebody's got a mobile phone or some sort of device that's making a noise, could you please turn it off? So I, I mean. I found that terribly off-putting yeah. and unpleasant. We're, we're, we're starting your time again, so if you'd like to start again, we'll... Thank um, you. OK, thank you. Right. You're being asked to approve this application largely on the basis of a presumption in favour of sustainable development in the absence of an up-to-date development plan. 
According to the NPPF, sustainable development should enhance sustainability and demonstrate economic, social and environmental benefits. Residents have consistently objected to this proposal because it meets none of these. Under your own definition, Bishop's Green is a small village settlement of limited sustainability. It has few facilities and services and is highly dependent on private cars. Adding 42 homes, increasing the population and vehicle movements at least by at least 20%, with no extra facilities or services, does not enhance sustainability. The proposal therefore fails this requirement. The application shows no tangible economic benefits to the parish or borough. In reality, the peripheral rural location with higher per capita service costs is bad for Basingstoke and Dean. Most commerce will go to West Berkshire. The economic benefit requirement is not met. The proposal delivers no social benefits. It increases population with no improvement in social or com community facilities. In practice, it's likely to produce a relatively isolated sub-community. Hence, the social benefit requirement isn't met. Some of it's been made by the developer to mitigate immediate environmental impact on the site, but consultees objected strongly because a development of this scale will add significant environmental stress to the nearby triple SI and sinks. The proposal shows no overall benefit to the area, environmental benefit. Despite Hampshire Highway's conclusion that the site has poor accessibility, the recommendation for approval claims the development will not cause an adverse impact to road safety. But the settlement can only be accessed via four roads or with narrow single track sections. The main access from the A339 is via a one-way bridge located in West Berkshire. Because of poor sight lines and a 40 mile an hour limit, there are huge numbers of near misses here. The road outside the proposed access point is an accident black spot. Nothing in the proposal will improve this, and hence the development is likely to add risk of incidents here. Local bus services exist, but are so limited that car transport is the only viable option. Residents with no car are very isolated already. <coughs> Cycling from the site is not a realistic option for most people. In summary, you should reject this application because it does not meet the NPPF criteria for approval. It does not have one minute sustainability remaining. and it creates extra road safety risk. As you should have seen from the rebuttal <coughs> table in the PC's email, the case officer report doesn't make a robust case for approval. It seems to gloss over many of the objections from key consultees, including borough and county experts and West Barch Council. Parish Council have, have created a well-supported neighbourhood plan that's been independently assessed as likely to enhance sustainability. Despite being at an advanced stage, this is being totally discounted. Residents see such a discounting of our plan as a travesty against localism policies championed nationally and locally, including by the leader of your council. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. If you could turn your microphone off. Thank you. Questions to the speakers, and if I could remind you, it's questions of fact, not questions of opinion. Councillor Howard Sorrell. Thank you, Chair. Um, I don't know if you were the aforementioned person who would be answering my question, in which case, if you recall, my question was to do with the, uh, the submitted update paper mentioning uh, that this site was the least unpopular of all of the proposed sites for the neighbourhood plan. Can you go into detail on that, please? Could, if you could put your microphone on, please. <laughs> it doesn't pick up onto the webcast if you haven't got your microphone on, right. so we do have to go through the okay. rigmarole of turning them on and off. No, I'm not used to this. This is my first time, sorry. Um, I can answer this and also Councillor Rattigan's question, probably at the same time. Um, the neighbourhood plan information is up on Basingstoke and Dean's website. We went through a site selection process. And yes, a smaller site in this area for 15 homes, which is what is in our neighbourhood plan and what is in the LPU proposal, 15 homes, the site 
was um, chosen by the community when they came to the consultation. This was in a, a part, we explained to them that it wasn't a vote, it wasn't a, um, it was not a uh, referendum, it was here are the sites that are on offer, this is what we know about them at the moment, um, what do you think, what criteria, we gave them some criteria to choose against, they came up with this as being a the most popular site. The site that we ultimately chose was also reasonably popular, but the important thing is that when it actually came to the position of the landowner committing the site to the, our plan, they chose to continue with this application of 42 houses for the whole field rather than commit the land to our neighbourhood plan for 15 affordable homes. And so that is why the site was not viable. It failed the viability test. It also, um, it turns out that Councillor Rattigan is quoting from an interim ACOM report. The final ACOM report um, had, had more information which actually was provided by the information for this site that gave ACOM uh, concerns about environmental issues and ACOM have downgraded the site so that it is a site that they consider will cause environmental damage. And the other one is clear. So. And, and the other site was actually given a totally neutral Yes, uh, the, rating. Um, the only the, the different the other site that we have chosen, um, all that acts against it at the moment is currently there is no bus stop. The bus goes very close to the site, but the site is we are suggesting could have a bus stop close to it, but it doesn't have one at the moment. Uh, so, does that answer your question? Yep. Um, <laughs> Councillor Howard Sorrell. Now, I have two more questions, so I'm going to try and ask one of them as a supplementary, if that's all right. As long as the yes. second a supplementary is a supplementary to the first question or the answer you receive, not a totally separate question. I'll give it my best shot. <laughs> so, we, we've been talking about the popularity of this site. Um, this was apparently, and I don't know if these figures are accurate because I think the previous speaker contested them, um, but this was preferred by 38%. The site eventually that was settled on was preferred by only 19%. Now, you talked about this site in terms of the smaller suggested development of 15 houses, but for this development, you raised a concern around highway uh, traffic because of the four roads into the settlement currently. We My supplementary, uh -huh. trying to keep it as relevant as possible, is how can any site preferred, the, the one that has been nominated as the preferred site or this site with fewer houses, do, do they not share the same concerns of highway issues? They share the same concerns to a lesser degree, but we were in the, in the LPU for Basingstoke and Dean, we've were allocated 15 houses, 15 homes for Bishop's Green. So we, we went out of our way to find 15 homes for Bishop's Green. So if there is a transport issue, certainly, um, having an entrance straight out onto the area where um, I sent photographs to the councillors of some of the more spectacular accidents <laughs> there recently. Um, we, if we have to put 15 homes in Bishop's Green, and there is, I mean, we want to see communities live and grow, um, and a growth of 15 we feel is reasonable, and the community feels is reasonable, we could absorb that, and, and um, people, got on board with that one. It will have cars, 
it will be more cars, but it won't be three times as many cars. So we were asked to find homes, a uh, place of 15 homes. We've done it, and we've done the best we can. And if a landowner refuses to commit their site to the plan for 15 affordable homes, then we have to go to a landowner who will give a site for 15 affordable mm. homes, which is what we have which is actually a very good site. I think you're actually straying from answering the question. So um, are there any more questions? Councillor Rattigan. Sorry. Um, were you, this is the question, were you either angry or merely disappointed when the Cabinet, including two of your ward members, uh, decided to ditch the local plan as it removed settlement boundaries and therefore remove the hierarchy of settlements, meaning that no number of alloc allocated homes would be in your parish. Councillor, I don't think that's a question of fact. It's a, you're asking her an opinion, so I'm going to discount it. Oh, am I allowed to make a comment in response? No, sorry, the, the question hasn't been allowed, so there's, uh, there's, there's no answer to be given. Councillor Freeman. Thank you. Um, just a quick one. Can you tell me, are the local schools uh, currently at capacity or is there room for expansion there? I'm, I'm, I'm concerned here about local infrastructure and whether there is ne it's necessary. Um, I, got have, I have visited as part of the neighbourhood plan um, research and stakeholder communication. We've been to the schools and um, also the health centres, and I was asking about a maximum of 20 homes in the entire parish, which is what is in our neighbourhood plan, and um, the schools could cope with that. The schools, the health centre said they could cope with that. I haven't asked about 42, but the schools are not at capacity at the moment. They could take some more children. Um, but whether they could take 42, I didn't ask the question, sorry. Thank you. Councillor Howard Sorrell, second question. Thank you, Chair. Um, you talked briefly about concerns around lack of services, lack of infrastructure in the surrounding area. Now, my question specifically is 42 new houses, I think somebody said it would be a 20% increase. Have you considered the possibility that that's likely to attract businesses and services to the area? An example that I can give is Old Basing has a very popular bakery now, a very small village with very little in the way prior, uh, in the way of businesses prior to that business being attracted to the area by development. Can you see a scenario where a similar thing happens to, to your village? Not, not in Bishop's Green because... Um, it's too close and too easy to the Newbury Retail Park um, for something like that to, to come into that village. Um, there's, the housing is, as you see, quite dense housing um, on the plan, so there isn't space to build um, a community, uh, I don't know, shop, or another one. We've got one in Bishop's Green. Ms. Dane, um, you once again, you, you've strayed from answering the question into answering, extending your speaking time. You're asked a specific question about in, improving infrastructure and in schools. If we could stick to answering the questions, um, that would be really helpful. I, Thank you. Sorry, I thought I was being asked a question about had we considered um, extra bringing in community. Uh, things and I, I answered no, I don't think it would. Councillor Tuck. Thank you. Um, you mentioned that you had environmental concerns. Can you, I've, I've got Gold Cops, Ancient Woodland and Sink. Um, I, obviously that we're hoping that's as protected as it can be. And I've got Pipstrel bats and hazel door mice and I've got a chalk stream adjacent to the site. Can you pinpoint specifically for me where your other environmental concerns would be, please? I think Councillor Isaac is going to be talking to that one. Yes. Um, but so there are there are other issues. 
I'll leave you to that, John. If I may, Chairman, to do with the environment, um, as, as West Berkshire have actually said in their objection, the, the landscape is a vital part, a five component of that area for West Berkshire, and they've said there will be significant harm by, by this development because the whole area will be red with this suddenly a housing site in the middle of what is just a patchwork of fields and woodlands. So that's one big issue. Thank you. If you could turn your microphone off, please. No, Any more questions for the speakers? Thank you. Thank you very much. And if we could have Mr Simon Packer, please. Good evening, Mr. Packer. You have four minutes. I will warn you when you have one minute remaining. And uh, microphone button is in front of you. No, it lights up red. Try the other button. That's the one. That's the better. That's the right side. <coughs> Thank you, Chair, and good evening, uh, councillors. Uh, it's not the intention to repeat the detail within the comprehensive report prepared by your officers in recommending this application to you for approval. However, there are some matters that my client considers are worth highlighting. My client recognises the hard work that has been undertaken to date by the Parish Council in progressing the neighbourhood plan and is supportive of many of the emerging policies, including those securing design quality, biodiversity enhancements and low energy, low water use housing. To confirm, the application was submitted and registered on the 22nd of January 2022, at a time when background evidence was being prepared on the plan, including a call for sites exercise. The application was submitted for consideration as part of this process and prompted correspondence between my client and the Parish Council regarding its potential inclusion in the plan, as you've heard. This included a request from the Parish that the extent of the site being developed be reduced from 50 units to a maximum of 15 with an indication that the site could become the preferred option for an allocation, but only if the current application, the outline application, was withdrawn. This request to withdraw had to be considered carefully by my client in the context of an emerging neighbourhood plan and local plan, and where the council could not demonstrate a five-year supply. The context for both still apply today, and the implications of which are covered in detail within the officer report. Yes, there is a modest number of houses proposed over and above that which the emerging plan is seeking, but importantly, also a greater number of affordable houses to meet significant affordable needs. As advised by the Council's Strategic Housing Manager, as of September 2022, there is a need for 24 affordable houses within the parish, as well as an overwhelming need for over 4,000 affordable houses within the borough as a whole. My client therefore did not withdraw the application, obviously, but equally the without prejudice reduced scale scheme remained available to be allocated through the neighbourhood plan. The subsequent assessment of the site through the technical report supporting the Regulation 14 plan, as you've heard, concluded that it performed the best relative to all the sites that were assessed, including the now proposed allocations, that no negative effects were identified and a positive effect was concluded for transportation. Equally, again, as you've heard, the consultation feedback with parish residents concluded that the site scored highest out of the sites assessed for community preference in Bishop's Green at 38%, compared with 19% for the proposed main allocation in the plan. My client shares these conclusions, believes the wider site is the most suitable site for delivering current market and affordable housing needs within the parish, as well as providing an invaluable contribution to wide, wider five-year supply through the borough. It has the greatest potential for one minute remaining. Thank you. It has the greatest potential for securing non-car based travel, given the proximity to the existing village hall, shop and play space, and bus stops immediately adjacent to the site. These provide connections to Green and Common, Newbury and related employment opportunities. The proposed pedestrian links to Ash Road facilities to the south, committed upgrades to the existing bus stops and provision of dedicated footway connections to it will enhance these credentials. The scale of development would not generate a level of additional traffic that would adversely affect the local highway network as confirmed by Hampshire Council as Highway Authority. 
Should outline permission be granted, the intention would be a swift submission of reserve matters and subsequent delivery on the site. Given the landowner ties to the local community, it is prerequisite that any selected builders not only deliver an attractive product, but also ensure no differentiation between social and market housing in terms of quality. Could I ask you to wind up now, please? Thank you. Um, for all the above reasons, we respectfully request that you support your officer recommendation to approve this application. Thank you. Thank you very much. Questions for the speaker? Councillor Howard Sorrell. Thank you, Chair. Um, just a brief one. You mentioned that there are, or somebody stated that there is a need for 24 affordable houses in the parish. Now, this will provide 40% of 42, which I think works out to 17 affordable houses. Um, do you know of any other developments going on within the parish that will provide the remaining seven? No, not that I'm aware of, no. Uh, there, well, well, there are. There is a current application, I should say, uh, obviously on the on the other side of the road, which maybe uh, councillors are familiar with. Uh, yes, that is yet to be determined. Uh, that is of a significantly greater scale. It could provide significantly a uh, greater number of affordable houses. Um, I, I will leave it at that. There are obviously other matters that could be considered in relation to the scale of that application. Councillor Rattigan. Thank you. And land banking is an issue in this, um, in this borough. How quickly will we see a detailed planning application uh, and the housing bill? Uh, well, obviously on the assumption that a favourable recommendation is received tonight, um, that work has commenced on the Section 106 already. It's reasonably well advanced, so we would hope that that would be signed fairly shortly. Uh, that process will then be that a selected builder will be identified and I can imagine that a reserve matters application will be submitted reasonably swiftly, I would suggest within the period of three to six months. Thank you. Councillor Harvey. Thank you, Chair. Um, just trying to get my head around this shift of your client's position from having a conversation with the Parish Council about 15 units to coming full with an application for 42, which is nearly three times as many, on the basis of your argument, that being because of the five-year housing land supply. So please could correct me if I'm wrong in that assumption and your argument. That's what I'm trying to get my head around. <laughs> the other point, you place great emphasis in your four minutes on affordable housing. And I note that of the 42 units, only nine of them will be for affordable rent. They're in 53% of the affordable stock you're proposing, which is obviously out of kilter with our policy, desiring 70% rented and 30% intermediate. So you're not actually meeting the policy requirements that we've set down in our local plan as it currently stands. So if I understand correctly, could you describe to me what emphasis you're placing on the affordable housing? Or is it market driven? Because clearly only nine of the 42 are, in my mind, affordable. Yes, first homes category could be considered that, and of course it is. And so to the other intermediate product, however, only nine of them will be rented. And then again, I'm just interested in this balance. Why did you not go ahead with 15? Why 42? And was that because of the five-year housing land supply? And in that context, your applicant thought they could, as it were, get away with it, if you like. And that's not my interpretation, but move to 42. Thank you. Yeah, I, I understand the, the question. There are two parts to it. So the first part in terms of timing, um, as I mentioned in the deputation, um, the application was submitted back in January. Uh, it was actually at the time, uh, whilst clearly work had commenced on the neighbourhood plan, there was no reference to any specific number of units. The local plan had identified through a committee report a recommended level, which was around 15. However, that, at that stage, that was a very early indication of potential numbers. So, um, you know, at the point in time that the Parish Council confirmed that they were working to a number of 15, albeit the, the allocations in the plan actually amount to 20, um, that is at that point, the decision had to be made as to whether or not uh, we would... Um, be willing to withdraw the application, as the Parish Council has suggested, or whether, in the context of wider planning policies, it was uh, sensible, shall I say, to continue 
with the determination of the application. So at that, at that stage, I think the application had advanced to the point where we were in discussion with officers. Um, they were comfortable with the principle. There was just a case of details that needed to be sorted in terms of some of the technical issues. So I think rather than, it, it's a bit cart before the horse, I think this. I think the application was in. It wasn't a case of we, uh, the, the applicant, the client, deliberately submitted an application that was in excess of the number of units, because at that stage, no fixed units had been put forward in the plan. The second part to your question, I think, related to affordable housing. Um, so uh, the affordable housing provision that's put forward as part of this application and will be covered in the section 106 is uh, the, the tenure split uh, that the, um, the housing officer for the council has recommended. So we, we are simply responding to the council's own advice in terms of tenure uh, requirements. So are you saying that your client would have been open to delivering more affordable rented housing had the housing officer requested it? And secondly, just to pick up the point about the 42, so are you saying that you were aware of the 15 because we'd raised it, obviously, in the local plan, but nonetheless, the decision was we're carrying on with the 42, or rather the 50 to the 42, in the way that you described it. Is that what you're telling me? Yeah, I, I'll explain that in a little bit more detail. So at the time that um, uh, the application was submitted, the committee report, which I believe was a report prepared for your, um, is it your housing and policy committee, um, had made reference to indicative figures. It had also made reference to the fact that there were some considerable doubts about delivery of some housing, particularly in Tadley, because of the, um, the weapons establishment and the buffer zone requirement. I think there were upwards of 900 units that had been put forward that um, at the stage that the report had been prepared couldn't be justified. So that left some significant question marks as to where else was that housing going to go. And obviously one of the options would have been to look at opportunities for delivering that housing elsewhere within the borough. And that could easily have included some of the smaller villages. So that's the context. Um, in terms of the, uh, the, the question regarding affordable rent, I, I, we would be guided by your by your own council officers. So I, I, it's probably not for me to, to answer. I think if, the, if there was a significant need, the housing officer, I'm sure, would um, be making um, noises in that respect and, and the mix would, would respond accordingly. But that's not my understanding of the situation as it stands. Thank you. Any more questions? No? Thank you very much. Councillor Isaac. Good evening, Councillor Isaac. You have four minutes. I'll warn you when you have one minute remaining. Uh, seat behind that one. I think it's the seat behind. <laughs> I'm not sure whether that microphone's live. <laughs> um, I said you have four minutes. I'll warn you when you have one minute remaining. Good evening. Uh, this proposal conflicts with this council's planning policies. It is in the countryside, outside a settlement policy boundary, and as a category five settlement, Bishop's Green was to be allocated only 10 homes through to 2039. This application is for 42 homes in the countryside, not 15. Central to officers' recommendations is the absence of a five-year housing land supply, but now the government has announced that it is dropping this test and housing targets will no longer be mandatory. It would be perverse and wrong to go, against, to go against our own policies and apply national rules that are being abandoned by the housing minister. I question whether this report properly reflects the circumstances of this small community. The MPPF requires that before development, contrary to planning policies, is, is permitted, it must be shown to be sustainable economically, environmentally and socially. The evidence does not support this. Our landscape team has formally objected 
stating that the proposals remain harmful against policy EM1 and would constitute a suburban extension with adverse impacts on the rural setting to the village. Is it right to override this assessment? Bishop's Green em emerged as a small satellite settlement after World War II, providing homes for US Air Force personnel at Greenham Common. When the Americans left in 92, the homes were transferred to Sovereign, who then built 148 more new homes for Basingstoke social rent tenants. It is one of the borough's most disadvantaged communities. There are many ongoing social problems here. It is an isolated rural community with lower than average car ownership, inadequate public transport, and few nearby jobs in the borough. A staggering 80% of the village's homes are socially rented. According to published indices, it is one of the 2% most deprived areas of England for barriers to housing and services. Councillors are serious, I know, about taking action to meet our climate change objectives. How can it be right that a development of this size be permitted in such an unsustainable location with so few facilities? This council has declared an ecological emergency. As ward councillor, I believe that important environmental threats have not been given full attention. I'm concerned about the impact on nearby Greenham and Crookham commons, the thousand acre site of special scientific interest, which includes Bishop's Green Heath itself, 300 meters to the north of the site. These protected heath and grasslands are scarce and nationally important. A pedestrian link from the site connects to Bishop's Green Heath, a sensitive habitat containing snakes, lizards, badgers, as well as endangered night jars. These will be put at significant risk by the new inhabitants, their children, their dogs, and their cats. You have in, one minute remaining. In speaking to the local wildlife trust, it is clear that these threats have haven't been fully investigated or addressed. On 29th September, the Trust confirmed to the LPA that it did not consider changes made significant enough to alter its impact on the local environment. The site promoters need to engage properly with this Trust and more officer work on impact and mitigation is required so that this committee can be assured we are meeting our environmental responsibilities. Finally, I endorse fully the case made about the relevance of the local neighbourhood plan. All councillors at Basingstoke can fully back neighbourhood planning. This application would subvert all the good work done over nearly two years by this community. This community has demonstrated by its actions its support for plan-led development, and on sound planning grounds, it would be grateful to receive this committee's support tonight. The, the, the community did its best to meet its neighbourhood planning uh, housing on this site, but was turned down by the developer. Thank you. Questions for Councillor Isaac? Councillor Rattigan. Thank you. John, um, you've endorsed this, the executive summary that uh, was being brought out. Unfortunately, um, it says on this, the identified need is for around 15 homes in Bishop's Green and five in Etchingswell. All the extra homes should be affordable to buy. Do you agree with that? I don't think it's for me to, to agree or disagree. That, that's, that, that's not my role in this. <laughs> okay. Any more questions? Yeah. Thank you very much. Questions to officers? Councillor Rattigan. I'd I just like some confirmation on the buffer zone. You've said it's 21. Me. Can you just confirm that... Um, a, that's the right amount, and B, is it more or less than our normal policy, or has it been s squeezed in? So I just want to check on that. Thank you. Um, so this plan actually shows the buffers. Um, the largest buffer is actually with the ancient woodland. Um, the council's SPD requires um, buffer with woodland to be 20 meters. Um, ancient woodland says in excess of 20 meters. Um, 
there was a lot of discussion on the buffers um, with the Council's Biodiversity Officer and Tree Officer as well, because that had to be, the actual buffers had to be determined based on what we were protecting, whether it was more to do with the trees, more to do with the habitats within the trees. Um, so the buffers were agreed both by the Tree Officer and Biodiversity Officer. So they are in excess of 20 metres in line with the SPD, so it's 21 metres with the ancient buffer. It's five metres to the um, hedges and the young woodland um, to the south, and then there is the 10 metres um, on the um, eastern boundary. And I would also like to draw your attention to conditions, um, and in particular condition, I think it was six, which actually um, secures these buffers. Um, and it's actually, it, it, it um, secures the delivery of this plan which you are currently looking at, and this is to ensure that the buffers are delivered on site if planning um, was to be granted for this outline application. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Rattigan. Uh, on, well, obviously we are, we are assessing all matters reserved um, access. You've talked about vehicle access. Can you just tell me where the walking access is to the main bit of uh, the village? Where is that going to be? The existing access. No, I, the, there's no walking access between the site no. and the and the, the main part of the village. Um, have you had an indicative of where that is? So the pedestrian access, obviously, um, to the existing village, it's off Ash Road, oh. so it's just to the south of the application site. Um, the proposed access pedestrian access would also be incorporated within the vehicular access, the proposed access, and then obviously you've got the pedestrian access um, into the public rights of way, and there will be the connection with Haria Road, which would be another pedestrian connection um, between the new and the existing. Uh, Chair, thank you for that. I just wanted to know where it was accessing into Haria Road. Thank you. Thank you. Any more questions? Councillor Tomlin. Thanks, Chair. I've got a couple. The first one, um, our first speaker, I think it was Mr Homer, he, he made reference to uh, a similar local scheme that was rejected by the inspector stating prematurity. Have we got any detail you could share with us on that, please? That's my first question. Use it, error councillor. Um, that was, I think, the reference to, to the um, Hearts Lane Berkeley scheme, if I've understood the speaker correctly. Um, and that appeal decision, um, effectively, the, the neighbour plan was at a more advanced stage than the Bishop's Green one is now. Um, specifically, um, the inspector's decision at the time, and I'll just read this, the, the line just to be absolutely precise. It said, at the time the LPA decision made its decision, the emerging Berkeley neighbourhood plan was yet to be examined. As set out above, matters have now progressed following both the conclusion of the examination and the issuing of the Regulation 18 decision statement by the Borough Council confirming that he, uh, effectively the neighbourhood plan can proceed to referendum. So that is a more advanced stage than the current one, which is why I think the officer's report wouldn't I mean, it doesn't directly reference it, but I think the conclusion from officers would be that it, it isn't a directly comparable position. So, yes, it did. Uh, effectively, the appeal was dismissed in part on that ground, but that plan was more advanced. Thanks, Chair. Mike. That leads into my second question. That on page 97, we have all the, the different listing of where we where Where are we? Which, which paragraph are, are we saying we're at? Because there's been a lot of email traffic about it about to go out to consultation. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. So effectively, yeah, um, I think the officer's report effectively was to try and set this out as clear as possible, because I appreciate it's a very important part to, to how the committee considers this application. So as you say, if you, if you look at that um, summary, um, effectively, we are at the, the, the last two paragraphs of the is that page 97 so it's been published um, some very limited weight could be given to those policies where it's demonstrated there's a clear public support for them 
what's the plan has been checked for compliance with the MPPF, the existing development plan policy by the council, a little more weight so it's gone through that process. And now, as, as per the last paragraph, is then in the public consultation stage. But the public consultation doesn't finish until the 19th of December, so we're still within that consultation period, which is why then the second part of the analysis and the assessment in the committee report references, particularly at the bottom of page 98, references why, in our view, an assessment, prematurity couldn't be taken forward uh, it does say yeah, the MPPF talks about seldom taken forward when it's during a, a, a consultation period. Any more questions for officers? No? Thank you. In that case, debate. Councillor Harvey. Thank you, Chair. <coughs> I'll start us off. Um, bearing in mind the debate that's been here this evening, putting all the emailed everything else just to one side for a moment, that which we've heard on the floor of the committee tonight to deliberate on this. There's just a couple of points I wanted to make about what's come out. First of all, I think there are some serious lessons that this authority to learn about the local plan process. Because if we have a situation where a developer has had clear sight of our local plan documents at the stage of debate where we were identifying 15 units in an area, and then they were taking account of, well, you might discount Tadley and bumping it up to 42. It actually raises pretty serious questions of the process of how we do business. Because if by doing it that way, we've now got a developer thinking they can shove it up from 15 to 42, that raises serious consequences for other parts of our borough. And I just think we need to take that away as a lesson to be learnt of how we do these things, because it's clearly presenting a situation that in future will need to be resolved. I also have a problem where I have a housing officer saying we only need 53% affordable rent when it goes directly against the policy, and the policy is for 70%. That needs taking away, and that needs discussing offline as well. Because if we've set a policy for 70%, and we have a clear need for 24 in the area as identified, then why are our officers saying one thing, and we're hearing a different context come back? say 53 over 70. So I want that question answered and that's something else to pick up offline. That's not the developer's issue. That's another matter for us to deal with as a council. Um, the result of that is that you then wind up with more intermediate product, which has its own issues, and first home product. Again, different context from affordable housing has to be debated. The localism bit is important and I am weighing up in my head the local plan element, the neighbourhood plan element, because I do think it's important, but it's the way you give it. And the final point that really came into my mind when listening to the debate was, when is it in excess of 20 metres, in excess of 20 metres? And if it's 21, it's technically bang on. But I've debated that with Kennel Farm when we had it, and it was... So sometimes I just think, you know, a bit of step back and think about the policy and the meaning of it is worth thinking about. So I'm weighing all of that up in whether or not this application should or shouldn't be supported on the basis of the recommendations the officers are making. Councillor Howard Sorrell. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm just slightly leaning in favour of approval. I'd like to hear a bit more of a robust debate happen, but most of the issues raised tonight don't seem to outweigh the reasons for approval for me at least. I have a great deal of sympathy around the neighbourhood planning issue, but the fact that we can't give it any weight as per the report means that our hands are almost tied um, from my perspective at least. So I'm hopeful that somebody else will come up with some other reason that we can give these people what they want. Um, but at this point, I'm leaning in favour of approval. Councillor Howard, so is that, are you moving for approval? No. Not at the moment, okay. Just so we can be absolutely crystal clear. <laughs> yeah. Councillor Tomlin. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, so, um, thoughts. Um, sustainability. I look at our, our assessment on page 102, and quite frankly, it doesn't really cut the mustard. Uh, economic, we might actually use the little shop it might make the little shop better is that it environmental um, we hope that they will note the developer will note that we want better energy efficient homes 
um, and a bit of biodiversity net gain, but we don't really know about that yet. And then social, it just talks about that shop again, and, and Councillor Harvey's, we're not quite sure about the, what it does with the housing. When we go there, that site, as I went on the site visit, um, it is next to an existing development, but it's basically, as we saw, paddocks. It's been reviewed by our landscape team. They're not too happy with it. Um, we've heard comments about the domestication impacts on the triple SI. Um, so there's, there's, there's negativity there. Um, looking at the, there is a bus stop and the bus is once an hour um, and the footpath is fine, except when you get down to West Berkshire where the river is, then there's a very narrow bridge and then it all goes particularly, I wouldn't want to walk along there. Um, and actually, where am I going? Because I'd need to take a car or a bus to get to the shops or services. The schools are five kilometres away. Um, it, it all adds up to this is, this is very much, if we were able to use all our policies with the weight we should give them, um, you know, against EM1 and against EM6. It's, it's new housing in the countryside, it's quite clear. And then the big, I, I'm afraid the elephant in the room for me is this um, neighbour development plan. It is so, so close to going through, um, through uh, the referendum. It sounds like it would walk the referendum, and that's merely a formality, but I understand it's due process. Um, our local plan or our emerging local plan yes we identified 15 houses we haven't debated that and we put it on hold but it's not actually been either supported or thrown out but that's still an intention where officers have looked and made assessments so this seems contrary to what that would have been trying to tell us um, and yeah that, I, I just look at the whole thing and see that it doesn't really stack up and the, the neighbourhood plan and a lot of work that's been done and the very fact they've embraced taking on 15 houses because a lot of our neighbourhood plans are actually fighting any housing. So in many respects, it, it's to be commended. Um, and the, you know, then um, Councillor Isaac highlighted lots of the, uh, the impacts again on the um, biodiversity front. So that's where I am. I'm not going to do anything at the moment, but I will add that to the debate. Let's see how we go further, because we're early on. So, thank you, Chair. Councillor Rattigan. Thank you. Um, most of you won't know, but I, I deliver papers in that parish, so I know it particularly well, um, and um, obviously speak to a number of residents, both there and uh, joining uh, in West Berkshire. Um, the sustainability, and I, I have to admire the, the work done in the neighbourhood plan draft, because obviously I've read it all and, and made a point of, of doing so, because I think it does help where we are. Um, in my view, uh, it is a sustainable site. The bus stop outside the application site, which I think a number of us saw the other day, um, I walked from there yesterday. It took me 12 minutes for a 61-year-old guy who'd had a heart attack, it wasn't too bad, from into the green employment site. So I think it can be done. I absolutely agree with somebody. You, can't, you couldn't cycle it. Um, it's, it's horrific. So I do believe it's sustainable in, in employment terms. We, it is a well-contained site. I think the officer uh, made that point. And it's connectivity to... Harrier Road, Merlin, um, are all there. I know I deliver papers to Kestrel, which is not a million miles away at the top end of that development. And genuinely, um, there is a sense of community within uh, Bishop's Green. I noted a number of the, the um, emails, and there were a number of emails that a number of us received in the last few days, um, were from Etchinswell. Many of them were more than two and a half miles away from, from the site of this. I genuinely believe that we should be looking at page 118 for the reasons to support this. The fact that, and I accept Councillor Harvey's view, that we haven't got our housing uh, ducks in line yet, but there's an obvious need in Bishop's Green and Etchinswell. It's been a well-formulated community, um, 
through our social housing partners. And I don't doubt that um, the delivery of social housing will be good and will enhance the community. So I have uh, no real issues with their recommendation. It is a non-balanced one. I think there is nothing that we see in this, in this um, uh, committee that is so straightforward we either nod it through or reject it. And as has already been pointed out, um, we do have a five-year housing land supply issue, which we need to do something about. Um, and we are already on the naughty step with the inspector. I think we can support this, and therefore I move the recommendation. Thank you, Councillor Rattigan. Do we have a seconder? Councillor Howard Sorrell, thank you. Councillor Freeman. Um, just to add my two pennies, uh, my main concerns uh, to start with were around whether the local infrastructure, schools, etc., would cope. But they don't seem to be at capacity at the moment. And I think, this, you know, a little development like this might prove a welcome boost to the local economy and, and the schools because schools are sort of like their, their funding is determined by the amount of pupils they've got. So a few more pupils, it, you know, if they're not currently at capacity, they might have room to, to take the, the, the extra. Um, I really, you know, I'm happy to support the motion. I, I don't see any really valid reasons to refuse at the moment. Thank you. Anyone else for debate? In that case, it's been moved and seconded for approval. Those in favour? That's six. And those against? Two, three. And any abstentions? Sorry, you were against. <laughs> okay, four against, and abstentions were two. Thank you. That is approved. Our letter. So the recommendation is to um, approve, and this is now accepted, um, subject to um, conditions listed in the officer's report and the legal agreement. Thank you, Chairman. Item number two, Dellens, Overton, Overton Whitchurch. Uh, oh, give them a minute to swap out. Bethan, when you're ready. <laughs> Yeah, thank you, Chair. So this is an application at two Dellens. Um, the proposal is for the erection of an attached two-bedroom dwelling to an existing pair of semis. Um, there, is an up there is a few updates to highlight on the update paper. Um, these include additional representations made supporting an objection to the proposal. The objections mainly relate to character of the area, character of the area highway impact and neighbour impact, which have been addressed in the agenda. Um, one of the objections was received by 12 Red Lion Lane, reinstating the impact of the development would have on occupants. Um, justification is provided within the report, however, it is reminded that um, the harm is uh, in relation to overshadowing is in the afternoon hours. Um, oh, sorry. Um, condition 6 um, relates to construct. Um, condition 6 was also removed. Um, sorry, I don't know why I'm. Sorry, <laughs> sorry everyone. Um, so condition six was um, removed um, and um, as that is covered under condition 17, so um, come, some of the condition numbers were renumbered um, and the application is recommended for approval. Thank you. Thank you, Bethan. If we could have our first speaker, which is Dr Barrett, please. Good 
Good evening, Dr. Barrett. You have four minutes. I'll warn you when you have one, one minute remaining. And I think it's the right hand button on the deck. A bit lights up red. Good evening. Um, as a resident of Red Line Lane, adjacent to the development site, we believe this development contravenes planning considerations EM10 and highway safety CN9. You can only appreciate the impact this dwelling will have on 12 Red Line Lane if you stand on our rear patio. The land next door is almost three metres above us to begin with, and <clears throat> the new two-storey dwelling will therefore tower over us by 11 and a half metres. It will be overbearing, it will impact our privacy and light, and it will make us feel hemmed in. Overshadowing is already an issue all along our property because it is lower than our neighbours on both sides. Our rear patio is our main private amenity area because it receives more sunlight than anywhere else. We use it a lot recreationally, to dry clothes, it helps to warm the house. The proposed development will, as the officer's report states, exacerbate the existing harm caused by overshadowing to our rear patio and windows. Our north garden cannot compensate for the loss of amenity light because it is shaded for most of the day. So we cannot use it as an alternative space to enjoy afternoon sunlight. This will affect our quality of life. Modifications to the rear have not mitigated this as they will not reduce the shadow produced by the front of the house. No daylight sunlight survey has been done. There will only be a three metre gap between the front of the new dwelling and the boundary hedge. This will not match the gap between number four Dellens, the other side of the semi-detached, and its boundary. So it will look crammed in. It will create a terrace, uh, which will look incongruous at the end of a row of semi-detached uh, houses and bungalows that will not match the street scene. The existing terraces on Dellens are on the other side of the street. They're completely different in style and are well set back from the road. This will not be set back, and if, as the report states, the existing house is already prominent and highly visible, then this development will be overbearing and visually dominant at the crossroads. Highways initially objected strongly to this uh, development because visibility is very poor at the adjacent junction, and it was the site of a serious road accident. They later withdrew their objection based on a traffic survey, but this was misleading for three reasons. First, it implied that the existing driveway is being used, but it hasn't been actively used for about a decade, so the impact on traffic will be that of two houses, not one. Secondly, deliberate parking on either side of the automated traffic uh, consent, the ACCs, uh, for the exact duration of the survey caused a chicane, which resulted in <coughs> abnormally low traffic speeds being recorded. And thirdly, ATCs weren't placed where they should have been, according to highways. You have one minute remaining. Thank you. Worryingly, these data were the reason the visibility displays for the new driveway was, were reduced. Safety at the junction is a concern for many objectors because regular mere misses occur at that junction and because the junction is used as a crossing point for school children and anyone walking between the local playing field and the new skate park. The only place to cross the junction safely from pavement to pavement is the point where the new drop curb will be. Objectors, including Overton Parish Council, consider this dangerous. Please don't ignore this because it's a highways matter. Your planning decision will have an impact on this. The harm development will cause, not only to our private amenity, but to road safety and street scene, will outweigh any benefits. Finally, as the Parish Council said in the unanimous objection, the neighbourhood plan states that the development should improve the quality of life but it will not do so for the residents of 12 Red Lion Lane. Thank you. Thank you very much. You could turn your microphone off, please. Yes. Thank you. Questions for the speaker? No? Thank you very much. And if we could have Ms Downey and Mr Hodgson, please. Good evening. You have four minutes between you, and I'll remind you when you have one minute remaining.
Oh, sorry. Chairman, members, thank you for your time this evening. I hopefully won't take too much of your time um, and would concur with the officer and would urge you to approve the application. This application, as you're aware, seeks to erect a two-bedroom dwelling within the settlement boundary of Overton. The proposal complies with local plan policy and the MPPF, which is outlined in the report before you, so I'll not repeat it here. The scheme was amended during the course of the application, taking on board the comments from the neighbouring property at 12, at 12 Red Lion Lane and the light assessment that the owners submitted to the council. As many of you will see during the site visit last Friday, for which my colleague Ian Lasseter attended in my absence, the topography of the site means that 12 Red Lion Lane has, is on a lower ground level than the site in question. The redesign of the scheme, taking it from a three to two bedroom dwelling and, a remo and removing a two storey element at the rear has overcome the issue raised in regards to light. The officer states in the report before you on page 149, the development would not result in an undue loss of privacy or cause undue overlooking, overshadowing, overbearing or noise. Furthermore, in fulfilling due diligence, the officer visited the neighbouring property at 12 Red Lion Lane through the course of her considerations. The officer noted that the property already suffers from overshadowing due to the topography being significantly lower, its own high retaining wall and tall landscaping. Furthermore, in the update paper, the officer reiterates that the North Garden is usable and that the supposed loss of light from the development is not sufficient to warrant a refusal of the application. We support the officer's assessment that there is no significant harm when considering this proposal. A number of objections from residents relate to highways. The applicant commissioned an independent assessment which was conducted by Nick Colhane. Mr Colhane is a transport consultant with over 34 years experience. During the course of a week in May 2021, during term time, he assessed that the highway impact and sight lines including speeds and swept path analysis. His findings and subsequent report have been accepted by the local highway authority. Finally, the main reason this application has taken so long to be heard by this committee is due to the nitrates issue. This has been overcome by an agreement to purchase a nitrate credit to offset the development to ensure nitrate neutrality and has been agreed by Natural England. We would be very happy to answer any questions that you may have, but we fully support the officer's opinion and would ask members to support the officer's recommendation and approve this application. Thank you very much. Thank you. Questions for the speakers? No? Thank you very much. And if we could have Councillor Williams, please. Good evening, Councillor Williams. You have four minutes. I'll warn you when you have one minute remaining. Good evening, everybody. Um, as the borough council, councillor for the ward, I oppose the application. I recognise the value of proposed development, but it needs to be of the right type, in the right place, and in accordance with the Overton neighbourhood plan, add to the quality of life. My specific objections can be summarised as follows. As indicated by the knowledgeable Paris Council, it is a squeezed in, overcrowded development which is visibly apparent from close inspection of the site from all aspects. It's something which is not readily apparent from the papers and the paper work. Um, Mr. Barrett has talked about the difference in height between the adjacent with two Dellens and his own property. Um, it is also arguably out of, out of context with the character of the area. It's the northern side of Dellens that has 50s type council housing and terrace. The, 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 the southern side, the northern side, actually doesn't have uh, terrace properties. Uh, I think it's an unacceptable detriment all round. It also impacts, um, as the objection have indicated to two Dellens itself. There's a loss of light, there's a loss of rear access, and the important side windows to two Dellens are also lost. But there is also clear de detriment and deprivation of privacy and light to 12 Red Lion Lane, which sits close to, but as I indicated, quite a bit lower than, than the other property. The planning officer acknowledges that uh, detriment is exacerbated in terms of the impact and loss of light, but I cannot accept that this is somehow mitigated by the fact that there's 
existing overshadowing or that the loss does not occur throughout the full afternoon. What, what we've got is a property, if approved, that would dominate red, 12 Red Lion Lane. Finally, I agree with local objectors who have first-hand knowledge of the situation and consider that the highways officer was right first time, that the development represents increased safety risk. It is a uniquely dangerous junction because of the gradient uh, and, and the four crossroad points there. And I think the point that hasn't been properly uh, informed is that is an important pedestrian access, not just to the south, to the skate park, but to the main part of the village, and, and that, that is followed. So it is particularly dangerous there because there is no footpath down Red Lion Lane, and traffic can come there. Nor do I think that the... You have one minute remaining. Nor do I think that the issue of speed, it, vehicle speed, is the only factor in that. It is a, a particularly cluttered junction, very dangerous, in relation to it. I've used it regularly myself and I appreciate the danger that exists there. So I think on all these grounds, the application should be refused. Thank you. Questions for the speaker? No, thank you very much. Questions to officers? No, Councillor Rattigan. Thank you. The, um, the applicant or the agent alluded to the uh, designation of mitigation. Where is that mitigation taking place? In regards to, yeah, so it's an Eastleigh Borough Council scheme, so that is, um, it's in their borough, but they're mitigating it through for, for the whole of Hampshire. Chair, if I can suggest, therefore, in future reports, we get to know where the mitigation is. Um, uh, you know, if we've got a reason for approval, can we put it where the mitigation is? If it's in Eastleigh, I think it ought to be there, so those people are well aware of it. Thank you. Any more questions for officers? Councillor Howard Sorrell. Thank you, Chair. Um, the applicant made a point of emphasising the fact that uh, the fourth reason for approval says uh, there would be no result uh, in undue loss of privacy or overlooking, overshadowing, etc., etc. Um, on page 156, the report from the officer says the exact opposite. I don't know how the officers have said there is no. Uh, it says undue, so um, yeah, so we we're noting there is harm, but not any undue harm to warrant refusal of the application. Right, okay. Um, Supplementary to that, then, there is a specific paragraph right at the bottom of page 156 that says, um, sorry, I'm trying to find where to start reading. Uh, there is normally the potential to achieve adequate levels of daylight and outlook when no part of a building cuts through a line radiating at 45 degrees from the center of a window that lights a habitable room. Uh, do we just not care about the garden then in this context? Because that's where the, the person objecting said that most of the impact would be felt would be their use of the garden. So if we can't use the garden as a reason for refusal, then that, that's fair enough. But it, I... So this is guidance. That's a 45 degree rule relating to daylight and outlook um, from, from a window. Um, that's just guidance in our, it's not, it's purely there as guidance that we can apply to an application. Um, but um, the, the the garden is something we make the assessment. The 45 degree rule is purely relating to windows and it light into habitable rooms. So that's separate to the garden uh, considerations. Thank you. Councillor Tuck. Hi, um, I'm apologies that I've not been able to look at the street scene, but can you describe to me what the what's on both sides of the road as you look up? I'm looking at the location plan and it looks and I, I can't work out what kind of properties there are, please. So um so to the south that is a row of terraces, um, then there's terraces continuing westwards. Um, to the north, to the, to the 
on the north side of the road, there's attached properties. They're linked attached, um, um, but so there's there's single story in between the two story development. But it's very mixed there. Right opposite the site, you can see a group of terraces. Um, uh, they're clearly on the site plan, um, and there's not not any proper uniformity in the area as such. Um, so in this instance, we felt adding a terrace to a mixed area was not not harmful. So you, what you're saying is the new, the proposal where you've got a sort of semi-detached and you're suddenly turning it into a terrace, you don't think that's going to be out of keeping or jar with the street scene in the round? No, not when there is terraces opposite the site um, and that there's no degree of uniformity of pairs of semis on the north side of the road. It's very mixed. Thank you. Any more questions for officers? In that case, debate. Councillor Harvey, followed by Councillor Faulkner. Thank you, Chair. Um, page 157 really brings to mind the reason why I'm concerned. I think the impact is to be considered, and it's right that it's guidance, but it says here on a case-by-case -case basis. So on that basis... I think the impact on the neighbouring property is harmful. I think simply the fact that the garden is already constrained is one point, but the fact that this will make it worse is important. And I think that the 45 degree rule does indicate that, yes, during a proportion of the day, it will have a significant impact on the neighbouring property. So, you know, therein, there is harm. Um, so on the basis of that, and I think that is the strongest argument in my mind, I would move rejection on the basis of EM10 and the damage to the amenity, the harm to the amenity of the neighbouring property. We move for refusal. Do we have a seconder? Councillor Howard Sorrell. Um, I've got Councillor Faulkner down to speak. <coughs> Thank you, Chair. Yes, I would agree with Councillor Harvey. Uh, the site visit well, it's very interesting because um, what you see on the site visit is nothing like what you see in these photographs. I asked a question which was actually a matter of building regs, which was there's this, an 11-foot drop. Uh, so what, what is the danger of a, a building like that causing the collapse onto the, the house that's 11 foot below? I said, well, that's a matter of a building regs. Well, okay. But then you realise the scale of it uh, will have a severe impact in terms of light and overlooking. And, and that, for me, was a major problem. So I'd support Councillor Harvey's suggestion for refusal. Are there any more speakers before we go to the vote on it? Um, OK, moved and recommended. Yeah, please do. Thank you, Chair. Can I just clarify the reason for refusal in relation to impact on amenity? Is that in relation to overshadowing as opposed to overlooking? Uh, and is it in relation to both uh, property or property and garden? Sorry to for... I'm happy to say that I think it is both the garden and the property. I think it is the overshadowing. And I would like your advice in terms of overlooking because I'm minded to it but I would appreciate your advice on the matter. I think overshadowing was my argument, but I do know that Councillor Faulkner mentioned overlooking, so let's just get a comment on that. I think the, the officer assessment is that overlooking wasn't a... Well, obviously, the officer assessment was neither was um, a reason for a few, but in terms of overlooking, I don't think there's a particularly strong position there, Councillor. Thank you. Moved and seconded for refusal for the reasons given. Those in favour of refusal. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. One, two. Can we keep the hands up for a sec? Whilst we're one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I'll make it ten. And those against refusal. Two. Thank you. That is refused. Could. I think, could you confirm? Thank you. So the application is refused on impact to, in terms of overshadowing to 12 Red Lion Lane. Thank you. OK. 
Okay. Item number three, land at Ramsdale Road, Pamba End. Lisa. Thank you, Chair. This is a, a full application for the erection of two three-bed dwellings using the existing access onto Ramsdale Road at Pamba End, Tadley. The site lies outside any recognised settlement policy boundary and their fight, um, and were met by the applicant's agent. Uh, and at that site viewing, members requested that um, other development and applications being considered by the local planning authority could be identified tonight. Uh, and we have um, two applications. Um, one is a um, planning uh, permission in principle application, which is pending consideration, not yet determined, therefore uh, not a material consideration, uh, as shown on the plan here, which is immediately to the north of the site we're considering today. And then an application that was granted by reasons. Uh, the site isn't considered to be physically isolated, but it is considered to be harmful to the landscape character of the area. There's also lack of information to fully assess uh, the potential impact on important trees and also lack of information requiring the provision of visibility space. Thank you. Go our first speaker, Mr Cottrell. Good evening, Mr Cottrell. You have four minutes, and I'll warn you when you have one minute remaining. Yeah, good evening, Chair. Um, as you've just heard there from the uh, presenting officer, it's recommended at the moment for three reasons for refusal. All right? The first one being the landscape harm. Those of you that attended the viewing panel on Friday will remember that I did ask you to pay note to the field to the north of the application site. This is the PIP site, which is uh, shown on the screen up there. A few weeks ago, the landscape officer provided their comments for that site, and I will quote, the, alter uh, the alterations of the existing field to accommodate two dwellings would alter this character uh, from a rural to an agricultural nature to one that is overly residential and domestic. However, the abundance of development both agreed and proposed within this area of Pamba End has changed the character to one that is more urban in character. This part of Ramsall Road was very rural in nature outside the built uh, part of Pamba End with fields either side of the road and views over the countryside. However, this has changed in recent years with further encroachment into the countryside and it's changed the landscape and therefore they've raised no objection to that PIP site. Our site is literally alongside that site so i do not understand how we can be causing harm to the landscape but they will not uh, but they are not given that we are so close there is also the uh, development there that was also on the screen there for the three dwellings at rosebank that doesn't kind of make it very clear as to where it actually is it's much further into the site um it, in the update paper, it does talk about the ecology buffer zone um, to the south of their site, and that actually abuts down to the remaining land that my client owns, which will be remaining as an open field. Um, and again, you know, back to this harm, uh, landscape harm. I just do not see that there is landscape harm here that is, is sufficient to justify a reason for a refusal, especially at this time when tilted balance should be applied. Turning to item two, the tree officer originally claimed that the trees were a wooded area and requested a 20 metre buffer. This was then changed following a rebuttal um, and they have now requested a root protection plan, which um, is confirmed in the update paper. I've not been able to get this arranged just in time to obviously bring it before you, like I said on Friday. Um, but you will have seen that there's only two trees that are on that site in terms of actual oak trees. The rest of them are conifer trees and my plan does show where they are and does show the indicative root protection area. And as with many other applications, a suitably worded condition should be able to deal with that item. Turning to item three. Again, um, on Friday, you will have seen that I laid my tape out to show the visibility displays. Um, my tape was actually only 50 metres long, so it wasn't quite long enough. Um, but in terms of the uh, PIP application site, and I know you're all going to say all applications should be assessed on their own merits, however, they have had a speed survey carried out on that site. It shows that to the south there should be 75 metres in terms of visibility space and 68 to the north. You have one We're able remaining. to provide 115 to the south and 60 without cutting the hedge, so we'll cut the hedge, we'll be able to get the 68 metres that they're looking for to the north. Turning again back to that in terms of conditions, again, a suitably worded condition, in my eyes, can um, deal with item number three. Um, 
so again, the, the actual application, we're, we're really, we're talking in my eyes that it's about the landscape harm and it's whether you see this as causing landscape harm with development that's already happened at the back there and obviously the PIP application. I understand that the PIP application is, uh, is currently um, pending decision, but the landscape officer's comments are that there is no harm in this area for those guys. And I'll ask you to please approve this application and I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you. Questions for Mr. Cottrell? No, thank you very much. Questions to officers? No? Debate? Okay, I'll start it off. I looked at this and I tend to agree with the applicant. I can't see any harm. As I stood on Ramsdell Road looking into the site, to my left I saw a cluster of houses and scaffolding where more houses are being built. It's becoming a little, almost, you know, a little enclave of houses there. To my right was a very, very substantial hedge. So I really, really couldn't see any great landscape harm. There are two issues with it. There's a route protection plan that needs to be put in place. And there are sight lines that have got to be confirmed. But other than that, um, I really don't see any problems. I'll leave it there. Um, we'll have Councillor Faulkner followed by Councillor Tomley. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you, Chair. Yeah, following, following on from what you've just said from the site visit, I also noticed in the, in the background was an elevated main road where you can see traffic, so it didn't strike me as being, shall we say, particularly, as it were, countryside. But bearing in mind what this committee has just approved on item one of development in the countryside, I would see this as being less of an issue than uh, um, item one. So therefore, I, I, I would support um, an approval for this. Councillor are you moving it for approval? Because I particularly uh, yes, didn't. I'm happy to do that. Thank you. We move for approval. Does it have a second? Councillor Tomlin. Would you like to speak on it, Councillor Tomlin? <coughs> well, other than um, no, I, I fully agree with your comments that, that we must have those two conditions um, at least, plus the other normal conditions that officers will no doubt um, bring to the party. Um, but yes, it was quite clear that this is a um, an area that's being developed um, and, and, the, and the comments of the landscape I don't agree with in this particular instance so I'm happy to second it. Yeah I'll do it. Okay. Are there any, anybody else want to speak on it? Councillor Faulkner we need your reasons for approval and if I could suggest that we have conditions that we delegate to the officers a, a suitable route um, protection plan and the sight lines to be confirmed um, if you're happy with that yes. um, and your reason for approval um, well it, it's it's the opposite to points one two and three I don't quite know how to um, the, uh, <clears throat> this is not an inappropriate development in, in, the, in the countryside bearing in mind where it is and everything else that's around it I, I think from what Councillor Faulkner was saying in the discussion that uh, um, uh, I think the, the members are considered that there is no landscape harmful impact. Um, and I would just, I would just say, um, obviously, you've, you, you, the, it, with regard to the um, refusal reasons two and three, which um, Councillor Faulkner was saying was the opposite, you've, you've actually specified that conditions could overcome those reasons. And, and therefore, with suitable, suitably worded conditions, uh, adequate visibility could be provided and that there is unlikely to be harmful impact on important trees. Splendid.
Yeah. Um, so the application has been approved for those reasons we've just outlined. Um, and in addition to the conditions uh, referenced by Councillor Robinson, which were the reprotection area plan and site line being provided, I would just uh, suggest um, that we also add um, some more conditions um, with regard to approved plans, um, three-year time period, details and materials to be submitted, uh, landscaping and boundary treatments, that water efficiency to be provided in accordance with policy EM9, um, in accordance with the ecological assessment and biodiversity impact calculation provided with the application, <coughs> the submission of, of a biodiversity enhancement and management plan, along with external lighting details, um, the tree protection that we've referred to, um, construction and delivery hours, um, which were recommended by environmental health team um, as part of the application, and then uh, parking cycle provision and uh, waste recycling provision, if members are happy with those. Thank you. It's half past eight, so I think um, we'll have a five-minute comfort break, and we'll see you very shortly. Thank you.
Right, we will resume. Item number four, land off Ridge Lane, Newnham. Uh, Lisa. Thank you, Chair. This is a full planning application for a farm worker's dwelling for a temporary per period of three years, creation of earth buns and a farm track. Um, most of the works have already been carried out, um, including the buns, the farm track and the erection of the dwelling. Um, the, remote, the only outstanding works are the external cladding to be carried out to the dwelling, um, hence the uh, part retrospective nature of the proposal before you. Um, the dwelling is also occupied. Um, given this is for a farm worker's dwelling, um, information on essential need and the viability of the uh, uh, business has been submitted and independently assessed by uh, a council's consultant um, on our behalf um, and the detail of that um, is set out in the main paper before you. Um, both um, essential need and viability have been uh, accepted. Uh, the recommendation is therefore for approval. Um, a number of the conditions were include, included within the officer report made reference to prior to occupation given that we now understand the dwelling to be occupied those conditions have been uh, reworded to read within three months of this decision notice they are uh, a set out in the update paper before you thank you thank you lisa there are no speakers so questions to officers no debate in that case i will move it from the chair is there, seconded by councillor harvey Moved and seconded for approval. Those in favour? Well, that's approved, everybody. Thank you. That was easy, wasn't it? Yeah. Thank, thank, thank you, Chair. Yeah, so that application has been approved uh, subject to the conditions uh, within the main paper and as amended on the update. Thank you. Item number five, land north of Cufford Cottage, Cufford Lane, Bramley and Bethan. Thank you, Chair. So this is an application for permission in prim principle um, at land at Cufford Lane. The proposal is for four dwellings to consider only location, land use and amount of development. Technical matters would be considered at the technical details stage consent whereby a design scheme would come forward um, that the local planning authority could consider. Um, a number of additional ad objections have been received. Um, however, these reiterate objections made and that have been justified uh, within the report. Um, the, ap the application is recommended for approval with an extensive list of assessments required at technical details consent um, located at the end of the report. Thank you. Uh, these include, just to add, ecology assessments, a toad migration strategy and a biodiversity net gain assessment. Thank you. Thank you. And we've got our first speakers, which is Mr Cleave and Councillor Vaughan. Good evening to you both. You have four minutes between you. How you use that is entirely up to you. I'll warn you when you have one minute remaining. Well, thank you, Mr Chairman and Councillors. I've come briefly to talk about the environmental reasons for objecting to this application. We heard briefly about the toad migration. We've been studying this and monitoring it for many years. The uh, Basingstoke and Dean Today newspaper, the, I think the autumn edition, had a quotation from Councillor Bound, the green thread that runs through all we do is meeting our carbon neutral targets and enhancing biodiversity. And further on, we read in the paper an article on biodiversity and a new group's been set up in Bramley as the first step in the wilder Basingstoke and Dean scheme to improve and protect existing habitats and create new opportunities for wildlife. So I would suggest that building houses in open country on a greenfield site does nothing to enhance biodiversity. Now this is a nationally important site and certainly a locally important site. We're registered as a, a toad patrol, but not just about toads, but many other amphibians that use this important site. Um, they don't 
live there all the time. They migrate to spawning ponds, they move back again, and they move on a, a broad front to do this. So the key thing about this is that it's the location of the development that is really damaging. Um, calling homes eco-homes is all very well, but that really is irrelevant in this context. To the untrained eye, that field looks, may look like any other field, but from what we know from our studies over the years, it's a really key and crucial place for the uh, migration of the toads. Environmental consultants have been employed, but a one-day site visit at the wrong time of year and a desk survey doesn't give the full picture and none of us on the site have actually been consulted about this. I might suggest perhaps that you're all very welcome to come and join us on a toad patrol um, February or March next year and just see what the extent of the problem is. Uh, Chairman, members, um, I'm the County Councillor for Caliva Division and this lane lives in my patch. Um, this is what uh, my partner was referring to, Phasing Stoke, growing the borough diversity, which reads well and is very exciting, always assuming that you actually mean in there what you say, because I think there's about to be sanctioned a huge act of biodiversity van vandalisation, which would be upsetting. Um, if I can just deal with some of the statutory technicalities. The common toad is UK Biodiversity Action Plan species as is the Great Crested Newt. National Planning Policy Framework, Policy Statement 9, details the need to take measures to protect the habitat of common toads, to maintain and enhance existing biodiversity, and to protect natural habitats which provide routes for common toad migration. The National Environment and Rural Communities Act, 206, 2006, Section 40 states that all public bodies, that's us and you, have a biodiversity duty specifically to have regard for biodiversity conservation when carrying out their function. Since 2008, the inclusion has been reinforced um, whereby the UK BAP species, including the common toads, are recognised as a principal importance of conservation and biodiversity. Therefore, legalisation requires that planning authorities need to ensure that common toads are protected for the adverse effects of development. And Basingstoke and Dean local plan policy says that development should only be permitted where there is no adverse impact on conservation status of these key species. Common toads are key species and the impact of the development would be 100% adverse. Thank you. Could you turn the other microphone off as well, please? Thank you. Questions for the speakers? No? Thank you very much, gentlemen. Uh, we have Mr. Stephen Young, please. Good evening, Mr. Young. You have four minutes. I'll warn you when you have one minute remaining. Thank you very much, Councillor Robinson. Uh, good evening and thank you for the opportunity to speak. My name is Stephen Young from ProVision, speaking on behalf of the applicant Exbury Homes. Uh, as you've heard, the application is uh, for permission in principle for the erection of a maximum of four dwellings and they're intended to be uh, self-build eco-dwellings. Your officer's report recommends approval and provides a well-balanced assessment of the, of the proposal and we endorse that assessment. Tonight, I'd like to pick up on a few key points and explain why permission in principle should be granted. Firstly, and as you've heard, the scope is strictly limited to the consideration of the location, land use, and amount of development with other elements to follow. As you'll be aware, and as you've heard elsewhere this evening, the council's unable to demonstrate five-year housing supply and the presumption in favor of sustainable development is triggered for new homes across the borough. The site's not considered by your officers to be isolated as it's within 400 metres of Basingstoke. On landscape matters, it's not within a designated landscape, although it is within a strategic gap. Your officers consider that the density of development for units responds well to the site's character, relationship with the countryside, and nearby built form, and seeks not to urbanise that site. The site's well screened by existing vegetation, and there is ample space to deliver additional soft landscaping and planting, ensuring that the development will not erode the strategic gap, and therefore your officers consider the proposal acceptable in landscape terms. 
on highways, the Highways Authority has confirmed they have no objection to the pro proposed development. Um, and existing access will be reused to serve the uh, development and highways are satisfied that this provides a safe access and further details of that will be submitted at TDC stage. The ecology report concluded that the development presents an opportunity to enhance the biodiversity at the site and provide ecological enhancements to benefit local wildlife populations. And the information provided at this stage was considered suitable by officers who accept there is scope to develop the site carefully whilst being sensitive to the toads and their migration routes with details of further species surveys and information on biodiversity net gain, mitigation and enhancements can be included at the TDC stage and will be. The heritage report uh, identifies the site can be residentially, uh, sorry, uh, can be developed without harming the significance of nearby heritage assets uh, themselves or in terms of their settings and your conservation officer uh, have no objections subject to providing further details at TDC stage. Thus, the proposal meets all three objectives of sustainable development in the MPPF and it will provide a range of benefits by making a modest contribution to the five-year housing land supply. As a small site, it could be built out relatively quickly. And as I've said, it's, the intention is for four self-build eco-dwellings. You have one minute remaining. Thank you. The development will help to contribute towards the viability and vitality of the local community and will create opportunities for occupants to develop social and community ties. Environmentally, the development will provide biodiversity net gains and, and enhancement, enhancements, and it will seek to help divert migrating toads towards the nearby road tunnel across Cafode Lane. We hope members will see the overall benefits of the scheme and respectfully res uh, request that members accept your officer's recommendation to resolve to grant permission in principle. And this will allow the applicant an opportunity to provide details on such matters of access, design, landscape, heritage, and ecology for full consideration at the subsequent TGC stage. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Questions for the speaker? No? Thank you very much. Councillor Howard Sorrell. You have four minutes. I will remind you when you have one minute remaining. Thank you. Um, I'm here in, in three capacities. I'm, I'm a visiting councillor. I am very much predetermined. And I'm here as a friend to the amphibians. I have been out earlier this year for my first time and for a few days after toad patrolling. It was a wonderful experience. We went out with buckets, high-vis jackets and torches, and we picked up toads, frogs, newts of all shapes and sizes, sometimes a stack of two or three that were in the process of mating, and transported them safely to their ancestral breeding grounds. Now, I did that on Wildmore Lane. This is obviously an application of QFORD, but both areas are significant in terms of the, the sustainable uh, future of these species because it is a key breeding ground or they are both key breeding grounds for these species uh, the destruction of which will result in the continued decline of population numbers now this was my first year it was my partner's second year apparently this year the crossing rates were down from last year by a significant percent something like 20 or 30 percent fewer crossing the road this year at Wildmore at least uh, than they saw last year um, part of that was due to climate change, the, the uh, peculiar weather patterns we had in, in the months around their uh, traditional breeding time. Um, but part of it is cars run them over and they go splat, um, which isn't particularly ideal. And having additional cars on this road as a result of this housing will only exacerbate the problem. Um, this is an application for permission in principle we have had lots of conversations on this committee at various points over the last year about the issues around PIP versus TDC. Um, you can't easily refuse a TDC if a PIP's already been approved, unless there's really good reasons for it. If we, or I say we, if you are minded to approve this this evening, then it will be really hard for us to have any strong objections at a later date, which will allow us to actually protect these vulnerable species. Um, whether in principle or in actuality, this is a significant threat to these endangered species, and we need to do what we need to do tonight and refuse it to ensure going forward that they 
have the best fighting chance possible because they're already under threat. They have everything against them, and this would just be one extra thing that we can prevent. I say we again. You can prevent tonight by refusing this application. Um, you can refuse it on EM4, and that's all I'll say. It's biodiversity. It's a huge concern. And it, if the only reason for approval is the five-year housing land supply, which I think it is, um, that's that's easily counteracted by any significant strength of feeling within the room that the biodiversity issue stands as more important. Um, Do you have one minute remaining? Excellent, I'm done. <laughs> uh, I, I will just wrap up with saying I've never been in a room with so many attractive people, so. Thank you. S somebody will come and get you after afterwards. Thank you. Sorry, had anybody got any questions for Councillor Hellshaw? <laughs> Hopefully, no, doesn't look like it. Thank you. Questions to officers? No questions for officers? Councillor Tuck. Always keen on toads. Um, I'm a bit unclear though, um, how many toads you've got. I see the HBIC data records were for four in that area. Do you have any more information, please? No, we don't. Um, no, just, yeah, we don't. <laughs> Okay, so a historic but low-level population ripe for improvement. Well, we, we are aware that they are there, um, but um, we, they, they would need to carry out further assessments for us to know. that that's, that's what we would then ask for at technical details, consent to then find out those findings at that stage. So they've done a preliminary assessment, um, and there's a requirement for them to do more once we know the design scheme to come forward to assess that impact. Councillor Tomley. Thank you. Do, do we know when they did their assessment? Yeah, I think it's, or was it, um, it was July 2022, so it was summer this year. So not in the, sorry, supplementary, not, not in the March mating season, March to May, where these stout fellows were out with buckets helping them across the road? Let me just check the um, ecology assessment. Are there any other questions whilst they're looking that one up? Councillor Rattigan. Um, when we're discussing a PIP, can you, can the officer just confirm the four things that we are looking at? I think it might be useful. So it's on. You carry on. Yeah. Location, land use, and amount. Okay. No other questions? Okay. We'll, we'll have to wait for Bethan. I think it's also worth stating that planning practice guidance does clearly state that other statutory requirements um, apply at technical details consent, such as protected species and listed buildings. It's just, just to point that out. Councillor Tuck. Can I just, I realise this is a PIP, and obviously the challenge is what, as Councillor Ashkin says, what we can consider here. But um, I'm concerned about the um, archaeological issues and his historic um, setting there. I mean, how does, that, how does that work if you prove a PIP and then you get a more detailed planning application and you get, oh my gosh, there's some cracking stuff here. How does, how does that work, please? So um, Historic England were consulted and um, they didn't want to comment further on it until a design scheme came forward, which is we, we are accepting there are some challenges with this application um, and at technical details of consent. But as we've said in the report, without us knowing how big these dwellings are, how spread across the site they are, whether they're all in one building, we can't assess the impact on the historic uh, the heritage assets or the protected species. OK, 
Okay, so it was carried. So the assessment was carried out um, on a date in July, uh, in August. But um, obviously, we they, they, the report acknowledges that there is migration within the site, and that hence why um, we have asked for a towed migration strategy, which would require a report at technical details sent to be carried out within the, the migration period. Thank you. Okay, so debate, Councillor Faulkner. <coughs> Yeah, the previous picture you showed of that fence, uh, the site visit I thought was a disappointment because we didn't actually see anything because that's all we saw. Um, but I was left with the impression that this really was very much countryside. Councillor Tomlin. Thank you, Chair. Um, well, um, we've heard about the... T I mean, I live in the road, is the first thing I declare, and so I'm fully aware of these uh, valiant souls that go out there uh, and uh, actually undo the sign that says warning toads, and they're out there with their torches taking bucket loads of, of toads across the road. And I've seen the um, squashed remains of uh, a night where they haven't done it. But um, it, it's a difficult one. We, we've just heard... Well, uh, from Councillor Faulkner, uh, um, uh, um, that we didn't really get to, to see it, but it's it's certainly an isolated site. I mean, we we have just in the Bramley Ward received three planning inspectorate dismissals of housing, which he said he actually used um, our local plan or existing local plan policies to say that the sites he was looking at were. Um, isolated and represented country dwellings, which one was three and one was one, and they were not significantly contributing to the land supply. So we have a, an interesting dilemma there that when one considers this as, a, as a, a, a site that is remote, that we've had just recent things where a planning inspector seems to agree that our policies are valid, even though we have the five-year land supply, which is confusing, but anyway, it's there. Um, the thing with the toads, though, we, we, we have seen, we've had um, some uh, contact with um, toad people. I mean, they, they're using words like that there is absolutely no way mitigation um, or compensation could address the wholesale loss of terrestrial amphibian habitat and the destruction of traditional amphibian migration routes. Apparently, toads, uh, it's inbred in them where they're born. They have this, 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 this it's like homing pigeons, I suppose, this... this they will know where they need to migrate. It's, it's in, into them. Now, one of the challenges is a tunnel. We've had a tunnel put in the road further down the road for toads because there is a long stretch of the road where they, they cross in this site and a little bit further south. And um, I, I really don't see how toads can find a tunnel um, in the dark because it's only about 200 mil diameter, which is pretty small. So I don't really know that the mitigation... So, coming back to the pip. If we leave this to technical data, technical uh, detail submission, we've, we've lost our opportunity here. This, this is one application that we should, unfortunately, be considering as not a PIP, but it is a PIP, so we have to. But if it was a normal thing, we could have a proper debate and ask for deferrals, all sorts of things, to get the information. We can't. So we have to, I think, act in a precautionary manner and say that, that we have a lot of evidence that we have a very, very rare species here that we are endangering and we have no idea how we're going to mitigate it once we've actually given permission. And then moving on to the, the aspect just now we had explained to us about the historic... Uh, the, 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 across the road from the site is a historic manor house and it's got a, a, a moat and the moat is a, a national monument or uh, a, a English heritage monument. Now, to not be able to comment on that because we don't know what the buildings look like is slightly absurd. So we give permission for housing and then it could be something that really destroys it. But it's very difficult to, to do that. We need that kind of information first. So I would suggest, therefore, that, um, I mean, I, I think the debate should go on a little bit more, but I'm quite happy to move refusal, um, should we need to. I, I will do that officially. Um, and on the grounds that the biodiversity, the, the risk effectively to the toads, the lack of knowledge of that, the, date, the site is not suitable. 
So it's all about the site location in terms of its historic uh, impact to historic monuments and also to its biodiversity um, challenges that I think is not a suitable site for housing. Um, and there are lots of other things, but I think that will do for now. So I, that's what I'll do. I'll move it for that. Thank you. Thank you. Moved for refusal. Is there a seconder? Councillor Freeman, would you like to speak on it, Councillor Freeman? Um, just quickly, um, I don't think this is a suitable location for housing ever to be built on. It is toads. It's a very important place for the migration of toads, and I don't think we should be building on it at all. You know, that the location is wrong for housing, given that it will ca cause a huge adverse impact on an endangered species. Okay, thank you. I've got three more speakers listed, um, which is four more speakers listed now, um, which is myself, Councillor Rattigan, Councillor Godison, and Councillor Hussey. Um, when I'm first on that list. I agree with everything that's been said about the toads, but I think we are missing the other considerations, which if you looked at photograph A and photograph B that were up there just now, um, what do you see? You don't see any houses. You see open fields and hedgerows. This is... Oh, there is, there is a house there, yeah. Yeah. Um, this is isolated. It's in the middle of the countryside, as Councillor Faulkner said. Um, it's got massive landscape impact. It's got, and it's a terribly, you know, very, very, you know, just look at it, photo after photo, open fields. How much bigger impact can you have on landscape than that location? And as I say, it's isolated. So whilst I agree with Councillor Tomlin's reason for refusal, I would, with his permission, I'd like to add isolation um, and landscape harm um, to that refusal, if that's all right. Yeah, thank you. Okay, good, that's it from me. Councillor Rattigan. Thank you. Unlike um, two of the other applications we've seen today, um, there is very little built uh, environment around it. And frankly, on the basis of the location and the fact we could not see the site, I mean, we just could not see the site. We'd be making a blind judgment on this, and therefore I support my colleagues in the refusal uh, on this, on the basis this location is not suitable for a PIP or any housing in the future. Thank you. Uh, I've got Councillor Godison, then Councillor Hussey, and then we'll go to the vote. Councillor Godison. Uh, thank you, Chair. I, mean, <clears throat> I would have thought a very good reason for refusing was the fact that it's a well-established, it appears to be a well-established fact that this is a, a, an important and significant toad route. And therefore, until these, the, 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 uh, I think it was, it was, it was suggested that uh, um, we ought to be having some sort of assessments about what the impact would be on that particular field of those toes. And in view of all that, it seems to me perfectly reasonable to say that we should not be making a decision on, on, on this site at this moment until that assessment has been established and is acceptable to the committee. Councillor Hussey. I'll be very brief because most of it's already been said. If we were to support this application, what it's saying is we support biodiversity, but in our terms, not in nature's terms, we don't want to go that way, we want to go that way. Once we've agreed a PIP, if that way it doesn't prove to be suitable, what do we do then? It's too late. If you want to have mitigation measures, they should be trial and tested long before any approval of any PIP or any building of any kind. Biodiversity, if we support it, it should be preeminent in this case. This site is not suitable for building until the toads have had their say. <laughs> <laughs> Councillor Goderson, could you turn your microphone off, please? Oh, I'm sorry. Please do. Okay. Um, Councillor Harvey, and then Mike wants to come in. Thank you, Chair. I just want to emphasise a couple of points I think that are worth it for the debate that we have, so it's on the record. Um, we're asked to consider location and land use as part of an assessment of a PIP. So in assessing whether or not the land use is appropriate for housing, 
I think it's perfectly reasonable to take into consideration the biodiversity considerations that are in the report and before us. And on the basis of that, the national legislation is clear. In the UK Biodiversity Action Plan Priority Species, it clearly states that the toads and the great crested newts are a protected species, and we have a responsibility under that. The MPPF PPS paragraph 9, very, very clear, very, very detailed, again details the responsibilities of a local authority to protected species. Our own EM4 is very relevant here, and Section 40 of the National Act, the NERC Act, as it's called, is also relevant. All of that should be taken into account, and our biodiversity officer's objection, our landscape officer's objection, and the National Trust are actually objected. So while Historic England yet again decides not to comment, i.e. it's not going to cross their desk because they can't be bothered, it's not of such scale or such, they get that, the point is National Trust did. All of that to one side, my points about biodiversity are there is a suite of national legislation that should give us pause when it comes to land use and location. And on those grounds, I support the idea of refusal. Thank you. Mike, you want to come in? Thank you, Chair. It's just in relation to, um, I think there's three reasons for refusal in the motion. So one in relation to landscape impacts and isolation. Uh, one in relation to impact on biodiversity, one in relation to impact on heritage assets in terms of the scheduled ancient monument. That's the three that are on, on the table, as I understand it. Um, just in terms of advice, um, you, you'll, you'll make a, a, a view on the first one in terms of location and landscape impact, in terms of it being isolated. Effectively, you'd have to be, you'd be, have to be in the mindset of there is no scheme in principle on that site that would be acceptable. That's the basis on which you're deciding the application now. Similarly, on biodiversity, it can't be done on the basis of you would prefer to have assessments now, because that's not what the uh, PIP regime requires. It allows those things to be dealt with at TDC stage. You'd have to be of a mindset that any development on there, because of its location, is unacceptable. So as a matter of principle, that's what you, the, the position you need to be in. And on the scheduled ancient monument, similar point, really. Um, but I'll just, I suppose, reiterate that it has been subject to a uh, heritage impact assessment that's come in. There's no objection from the historic environment team on those grounds. There's Historic England have confirmed they're satisfied that they, that effectively it's a local authority decision, so it's slightly different from a no comment completely. Um, so it's just to bear all of those factors in mind. Councillor Tomlin, did you propose it on grounds of a, grounds of a schedule? Monument were unclear. Yeah. I, yeah, well, I said, yeah, the impact it would have on, on um, the um, listed buildings and the heritage monument. Yes, I mentioned the moat, which is which it is. Yeah. We just need to clarify it. Okay, thank you. Moved and seconded for refusal for, with the reasons given. Those in favour of refusal. Yeah, it's all set. Okay. Thank you. So the application is review, uh, refused on three grounds um, due to it being isolated and landscape impact, um, contrary to policy SS6E and the MPPF and policy EM1. Um, then the application is also refused on harm to biodiversity, contrary to policy EM4. And the application is also refused on impact to heritage assets, policy EM11. Thank you. All right. Um... Item number six, Signal Box Farm, Spring Lane, Burnclear. Um, Lisa. Thank you, Chair. This is a, a full application for the erection of an agricultural barn at Signal Box Farm, uh, Spring Lane, Burnclear. Um, the uh, update paper identifies that we did have a, a speaker who was uh, um, listed but is now unable to attend. Um, instead, uh, further representations, uh, written representation was made and a summary of those points made are set out within the update paper together with confirmation that the applicant um, has agreed uh, the pre-commencement condition um, in line with the uh, regulations. Um, this application is recommended for approval for the reasons stated within the report. Thank you, Lisa. And we only have the one speaker, Mr Cobbold. Good evening, Mr. Cobbold. You have four minutes. I'll warn you when you have one minute remaining. Thank you, Chairman. Good evening, Committee. Um, something slightly different, an agricultural barn. Um, and that's exactly what it is. And the, 
the object, objections we've, we've heard about, um, the parish council who have influenced this coming to committee have done so on the basis of a preconception and a misunderstanding that it's something other than an agricultural barn. Um, that's not the case. It's an agricultural barn which removes agricultural buildings which are run down, which have historically been on the site, and it consolidates them into a single building. You can see up there the access to the site. It's a well-established site with a well-established access, and the barn itself is required for the storage of agricultural machinery, agricultural equipment, to enable the maintenance of the land, including trees and hedges, um, etc. Um, so it's disappointing that we're, we're here talking about something um, which is based on a, on a misconception. Uh, no change of use of the land is proposed. It is submitted as an application for an agricultural building, and it is for an agricultural building. So it's designed as a functional building, um, but it will nonetheless be an official improvement on the current array of rundown buildings that you can see in front of you on the site. Um, to ensure against any intensification of use or alleged intensification, I should say, the size of the barn has been reduced during the course of the application to effectively consolidate the floor area that you're, that you're looking at at the moment um, to, to be roughly the same size as the, the existing buildings. Um, we've shown on the plans how it will be, in theory, laid out with room for tractors, room for a mini digger, um, workbenches, um, space for equipment for, for ditching, post, um, post holes, drainage, things like that. Um, and obviously every, every barn needs a bit of space for repairs and maintenance and manoeuvring room. So it's shown on that plan on the left as you look at it. Um, a bit of typical agricultural barn, corrugated fibre cement roof. Uh, box profile, uh, steel size, concrete block vertical at the base with a roller shutter door to the, to the front. We've been through the technical side of it. We've, we've done a tree survey um, to assess the impact of the development on the trees to the, um, to the west of the, of the building, and that's concluded that there's no, no issue there. Uh, the council's landscape officer has looked at it correctly in the right context, I think, um, saying that the barn is representative of a rural site and therefore in keeping with a, with a rural and agricultural location. Um, the landscape officer equally um, acknowledges the benefit of removing the existing buildings and tidying up the yard as a whole. Um, so that's all I've really got to say. Um, thank you. I, I believe planning permission should be granted. Thank you. Questions for Mr Cobbold? No, thank you very much. Questions to officers? Councillor Tomlin. Thank you, Chair. Um, regards the, the building, is it possible to um, uh, condition a, the uh, removal of uh, permitted development so that it couldn't later be turned into a dwelling? Council, I think it'd be, it'd be quite unusual because there's a, a time period that things have to be in place for, for a period of time uh, to do that. So I suppose there'd have to be a, a specific reason for doing so. I mean, normally, we've permitted, obviously, we've permitted development rights when we've dealt with them on things like uh, buildings, we've removed permitted development rights for additional structures. This would be removing permitted development rights for um, ultimately a potential change of use. But that, that would be something quite a long way down the line, given the, the time scales that need to be there in, in, in the first place. Um, but in, in addition, I think those would then be subject to their own process um, in terms of a, a addressing those. So, sorry, Chair. So is, is that right that it has to be in agricultural use for X number of years? T ten years, is it? Oh, OK, thank you. Councillor Tuck. Actually, I was just going to press the point Councillor Tomlin's making. We have seen that that is exactly how the planning system is manipulated. Uh, and I would be very keen to ensure that the building could, remained in agricultural use and there was no permitted development on that. I, um, I, I would just um, advise members to 
kind of really fully considered that. I mean, clearly we've, we've just mentioned that, you know, you've got the 10-year time limit. Also, you need to assess the application that's before you, not try to think what might happen, preempt it. Um, so... Okay. Any more questions for officers? Well, in that case, debate. In that case, if there's no debate, I'll move it from the chair. Is there a seconder? Councillor Harvey. Thank you. Anybody want to speak on it? No? Okay. Moved and seconded for approval as per the officer recommendation. Those in favour? And that is not okay. All except one. So one, two, three, four, five, six. Uh, Ken, what's Ken doing? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yes. <laughs> yeah, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. That's 11. And those against? One. Thank you. <laughs> that is approved. Lisa. Mm. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, application approved, uh, subject to the conditions listed in the main report. Item number seven, five, Jamaica Farm, Eggbury Road, St Marybourne. Uh, Bethan. Thank you, Chairman. So this is a householder application at 5 Jamaica Farm, St Marybourne. The proposal is for a single storey rear extension. Um, there is no update um, since the preparation of the agenda and the application is recommended for approval subject to conditions listed at the end of the report. Thank you. If we could have um, Dr Joss. Good evening, Dr. Joss. You have four minutes. I will warn you when you have one minute remaining, and it's the right hand button on the deck. Thank you. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to speak. I'm going to make a case against the recommendation, and I would like to speak to you on four aspects which all relate to planning considerations. The first is the character and origins of the historic farmstead. Uh, these were carefully retained in the original development, uh, according to the neighbourhood plan, by the preservation, uh, fundamentally, of the freestanding former farmyard wall. Uh, the proposal jeopardises the integrity of that wall and would also render the footprint of number five unreadable. The application cannot be said to, quote, conserve or enhance the quality of this non-designated heritage asset, nor preserve its characters, uh, character and appearance. Second aspect is on the impact uh, of number one Jamaica farm, uh, which is the house belonging to me. Um, there's some inaccuracy and error in the, in the recommendation and report, which may invite misinterpretation. The report refers five times to, quote, a courtyard area, but the term is used to describe three significantly different things. One, the boundary strip between numbers five and one that is the proposed site for the development. Two, the entire inner space of Jamaica Farm as a whole, as if it were open and communal. And three, the greater portion of that inner space belonging solely to number one and enclosed by the former farmyard wall. To clarify, there is no courtyard area the development would not, as stated, extend into a courtyard area by, quote, a minor amount. The development would destroy a functioning boundary space and encroach on an amenity space, which is a private garden. The effect would be overbearing. The garden would lose light, privacy and amenity. The revised application, proposing pitched slate roofs both higher and darker than in the original application, would make this worse. The third aspect I'd like to address is the practicalities, and there are four points here. The first one is the freestanding wall is not a party wall, but a boundary wall belonging solely to number one. 
It is of brick and white painted render construction and requires regular maintenance. And in fact, maintenance began this week um, as a matter of upkeep. A 10 centimetre gap between the wall and the extensions is proposed to allow for this maintenance. But no replacement of bricks, re-rendering or repainting can be carried out in a 10 centimetre gap. The second point is that you a have narrow one minute gap remaining. would create the perfect trap between the walls for damp, mould and dead leaves, all of which would accelerate the deterioration of the wall while simultaneously making its upkeep impossible. Um, the proposed extension would abut the back wall of four Jamaica farm, uh, covering an existing air brick, making access to the roof gutterings and chimney of number four ex extra hazardous or impossible. And the fourth point, there's only pedestrian access to the proposed building site, um, which would make uh, the movement of machinery or materials, if possible at all, uh, a, a safety hazard to the residents who include young children. Um, my final point, number five's ownership of the boundary strip has never been in question, but its suitability for development has. During the conversion from farm buildings to dwellings, the officer's report noted the future occupiers of five and one would be required to accept the existing situation. Could this ask you to wind up now, please. hitherto was the case. Um, the previous owners, rather than encroaching into this unusable boundary uh, strip, applied for and were granted permission to build on the other side, and I recommend that that course be adopted this time. Thank you. Thank you. Questions for the speaker? No. Thank you very much. Questions to officers? Sure. Um, next speaker, Mr. and Mrs. Elvis. Sorry, jumped ahead of you. Please take a seat. Good evening to you. You have four minutes. I'll warn you when you have one minute remaining. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to start by saying thank you very much to everyone on the Council for your patience with this planning application. Everyone has been enormously helpful and we're really grateful for your knowledge, expertise and support. Uh, the main point we wanted to address is the, uh, what was raised in the majority of comments on the application we made. Uh, that by unfortunate misunderstanding in objection to something that was never going to happen. At no point was it our intention to remove the existed louvred shutters that are attached to each uh, northeast facing window of our house. Our house is one of eight Jamaica Farm, and the shutters' existence is stipulated in the Jamaica Farm deed as a, me uh, as a measure to retain both our privacy and that of our neighbours. On the subject of overlooking, we are pleased to ensure that our planning proposal dramatically reduces any potential for this. We currently own an inaccessible, empty and uns unsightly strip of land <coughs> at the back of our house that we uh, have to access by going through a car park. Um, we, um, were we to use this land as a, as a garden area, for instance, it would impinge upon the privacy of the uh, garden at number one and would be very exposed to any neighbours walking past to access their front doors at number six, seven and eight, and is therefore not a preferable option for us. Building on a portion of this land feels the best possible outcome in terms of both ours and our, all of our neighbours' privacy long term. For the use of skylights for light and ventilation in the proposed extra rooms, our proposal reduces the number of windows, windows facing northeast by more than half, from seven to three. Currently, as I say, we have to walk all the way around our house and garden to reach this land, but the proposal creates access for us onto the land at the back of our house, access which would not only face, that would not face any other property being enclosed by the two sections of the proposed extension. The heritage of the area and the farm is vitally important to us, and we are pleased to have found a design that is approved by the experts at the council, retains the existing cladding and instituted at the time of its conversion from a cow shed circa 2006, Mirror the original roof as recommended and improves the appearance of the northeast side of the property for all who live at Jamaica Farm. In our village of St Mary Bourne, we have a very sensible parish neighbourhood plan and our planning proposal adheres to a number of its core values. These are the provision for home working, thereby benefiting the environment through the construction of a much needed study, 
creating an affordable home for a gr young, growing family. Our second child was uh, born three weeks ago, hence the shadows under my eyes. Sensitive residential development of agricultural buildings. Further details on all these points can be found in our application and our two comments on the uh, proposal in order to, uh, in response to other comments, along with the photo of our house when in use as a cow shed. You have hope, one minute remaining. I hope this all shows you, thank you. I hope this all shows you how seriously we take both ours and our need, neighbours needs and also the stipulations of both council and parish in ensuring that any building work is sensitively and sensibly carried out. Thank you very much. If you could stay where you are for a minute, could we Sorry. turn the microphone off? Um, there may be questions. Are there questions for the speaker? No? <laughs> Thank you very much. Questions to officers? Councillor Tomlin. Can you just clarify for me then, please, the, the, the um, common sense about bringing a development building line to within four inches or 100 kilometres of a, of a wall. Um, is it a planning matter or is it just going to be a civil case? Yeah, maintenance of the wall is not a planning, material planning matter to substantiate refusal of a single, <laughs> two single storey extensions. So it's a, it's a civil, civil matter um, um, and a building regs issue. Any more questions for officers? Councillor Harvey. But is the proximity of the extension to the wall a planning matter material consideration? Uh, it's, we, we, we assess the design and whether it's acceptable in terms of character of the area and design. And on, on this case, it has been considered that it is acceptable in relation to the area that it's sited within, including the pro proximity to the wall. Any more questions? In which case, debate. Councillor Howard Sorrell. Um, I've not heard anything planning related that would constitute a reason for refusal, and I'm happy to go with the officer's recommendation and move approval. Thank you. You saw a seconder for that. Ooh. Okay. Councillor Godison. You're seconding it. Thank you. Second by Councillor Godson. Councillor Tomlin, you had your hand up. Thank you, Chair. Well, I, I just find, <clears throat> I think the word is planning is an, uh, an ass or a ruder word than that. Um, I, it's just ca beggars belief that you can actually inflict a design on a neighbour where the neighbour cannot then access the wall, their property, to maintain it. And we could actually sanction that. It, I just beggars belief. But, but if that's the rule, then I suppose that's the rule we have to consider. But, um, well, it just, it, it just strikes me as mad. Thank you. Moved and seconded. Oh, Councillor Freeman. Um, I'm inclined to agree with Councillor Tomlin. I, I think it's absolutely ridiculous that they can build that close to a wall um, that has to be there, uh, and there's nothing we can do about it. I mean, I, do, I can't see any valid reason for refusal, which is a great shame, because I just think it's madness. It, doesn't, it, it, it makes no sense to be building so close to a wall that does need maintaining by its very nature, and leaving a 10-centimetre gap in, in order to do that. It just... It, it flies in the face of common sense. So if there are no valid planning reasons to refuse it, then I'm afraid we have to, we're going to have to approve it. But I don't agree with it at all. I think it should be refused. OK. Moved and seconded for approval. Those in favour? And those against? And I assume the rest are abstentions. Yeah, one, two, three. yeah. So that gets approved. Yeah. The application is approved. Thank you. Officer to confirm. Thank you. So the application is approved um, as per the officer's recommendation. Thank you.
Okay, members, we got item eight on the agenda, which is Nick Robertson Motorcycles, Bottle Lane, Turgis Green, Hampshire. Could I ask the officers to introduce the application, please? <laughs> members? <laughs> I didn't hear that, Councillor Hussey. Okay, colleagues, last one. Uh, th thank you, Vice Chair. Chair. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, this is a full application for change of use from uh, a sui generis use of motor vehicle sales and repairs to a class E general commercial use. Um, you'll note from the um, uh, update paper there's no additional um, information to provide to members, but just to note that class E uh, covers a, a whole multitude of uses, and um, those are detailed within the report before you. Um, the recommendation is for approval, but subject to conditions to limit uh, uh, some of those uses um, because that would have a, a, an impact on the level of parking provision that would be needed to, uh, which could not be accommodated on site uh, so therefore the recommendation is for approval with those conditions Thank you Lisa Do I have any questions to officers because I have no public speaking on this No questions, debate No debate Councillor Freeman <laughs> It's just me being a bit silly here, but if we if we approve it, when he comes back, can we tell him we've refused it just to see the look on his face? No. <laughs> That's me. No, no, no. <laughs> We're being recorded. That's not appropriate. We're going to cut that off. Right. In all, in all seriousness, thank you. In all seriousness, is there any debate, the top of debate? None. Any? Councillor Faulkner? Have we done a toad survey on this side? <laughs> no. OK, let's bring this back to being serious, please. If there are no debates, do I have a mover or for any particular motion? Councillor Hussey, you move approval. Do I have a seconder? Councillor Tomlin, all those in favour of approval, please show. That's everybody. And now ask Councillor Robinson to return for the final item. Uh, thank you, thank you, Chair. So the um, application is approved subject to the conditions in the main report. Right, thank you everyone for that. Last item on the agenda, which is our annual or quarterly quarterly appeals report. Um. Thank you, Chair. So, um, yeah, I'll, I'll be brief on this, but this is uh, effectively bringing back in what is going going to be a quarterly appeals report um, because of the time period. It's actually going to it's covered a six month period back. Um, hopefully, it's useful. It sets out the decisions that have been received between April and end of October. So. Uh, quarter one and quarter two. Uh, within it, at 1.4, the standard format going forward will, will record any cost settlements during that period, appreciating the fact that the cost settlement sometimes is quite delayed from when the actual decision was made, so sometimes they can be quite, quite different. There, there was no uh, cost settlements in this period. Um, in total, paragraph 1.5, 1, 1 uh, six out of 15 appeals on the whole were allowed, so that's at 40%, which is a quite high. Part of the reason for bringing this back uh, to members is to, I suppose, signpost where we are with appeal performance in general as part of our wider discussion around um, appeal performance. Um, the only uh, two that I particularly highlight um, in the uh, appendices, so Appendix A, um, is, I suppose, um, uh, one in relation to land at Roman Way and the other was in relation to Camrose. Camrose appreciated is uh, highly controversial, uh, but the reason it's recorded is because it's recorded within this, this time period. Um, the one at the Roman Way, which is on page 311 or 5 of 13, um, that was actually a decision uh, made on delegated powers for refusal, uh, one which was um, a, a written reps appeal in the end, um, where uh, effectively we won on, on almost all grounds. And I make the point simply that um, to, avoid the, to avoid the situation um, uh, or thought that simply because there's a five-year supply position, it means that you have to approve everything. That's not the message we're giving. It's just simply saying you have to take into account the five-year supply, but where you've got valid and clear reasons for doing so in terms of the MPPF and the t having taken account the tilted balance, you can still refuse, and sometimes we will when those on appeal. So it's just trying to get that point across. So it's not a message of saying you have to approve everything, but it is a message that the tilted balance is in play and you have to take that into account when you come to your decision. Councillor Tomlin. 
Richard, just, just to clarify, on page 312, I thought we, um, we um, refused the Camrose grant um, thing. That's why it went to appeal. Because it's got here, we approved it. And no, it you did. It, it was the recommendation was for approval. The decision was for refusal. Oh, I see. So not the committee. Right, exactly. Okay. Sorry, it's, it's, it's probably not quite clear. In terms of, we should put off the recommendation to be clear. All right, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much, everybody, um, and Merry Christmas, I suppose. <laughs>